province of Holland seems to be approaching near to this state. It is, therefore, unfashionable not to be a man of business. Necessity makes it usual for almost every man to be so, and custom everywhere regulates fashion. As it is ridiculous not to dress, so is it, in some measure, not to be employed like other people. As a man of a civil profession seems awkward in a camp or a garrison, or is even in some danger of being despised there, so does an idle man among men of business. The highest ordinary rate of profit may be such as, in the price of the greater part of commodities, eats up the whole of what should go to the rent of the land, and leaves only what is sufficient to pay the labor of preparing and bringing them to market, according to the lowest rate at which labor can anywhere be paid, the bare subsistence of the laborer. The workman must always have been fed in some way or other while he was about the work, but the landlord may not always have been paid. The profits of the trade which the servants of the East India Company carry on at Bengal may not, perhaps, be very far from this rate. The proportion which the usual market rate of interest ought to bear to the ordinary rate of clear profit necessarily varies as profit rises or falls. Double interest is in Great Britain reckoned what the merchants call a good, moderate, reasonable profit. Terms which, I apprehend, mean no more than a common and usual profit. In a country where the ordinary rate of clear profit is eight or ten per cent, it may be reasonable that one half of it should go to interest, wherever business is carried on with borrowed money. The stock is at the risk of the borrower, who, as it were, insures it to the lender, and four or five per cent may, in the greater part of trades, be both a sufficient profit upon the risk of this insurance, and a sufficient recompense for the trouble of employing the stock. But the proportion between interest and clear profit might not be the same in countries where the ordinary rate of profit was either a good deal lower or a good deal higher. If it were a good deal lower, one half of it perhaps could not be afforded for interest, and more might be afforded if it were a good deal higher. In countries which are fast advancing to riches, the low rate of profit may, in the price of many commodities, compensate the high wages of labor, and enable those countries to sell as cheap as their less thriving neighbors, among whom the wages of labor may be lower. In reality, high profits tend much more to raise the price of work than high wages. If, in the linen manufacture, for example, the wages of the different working people, the flax dressers, the spinners, the weavers, etc., should all of them be advanced two pence a day, it would be necessary to heighten the price of a piece of linen only by a number of two pences equal to the number of people that had been employed about it, multiplied by the number of days during which they had been so employed. That part of the price of the commodity which resolved itself into the wages would, through all the different stages of the manufacture, rise only in arithmetical proportion to this rise of wages. But if the profits of all the different employers of those working people should be raised five per cent, that part of the price of the commodity which resolved itself into profit would, through all the different stages of the manufacture, rise in geometrical proportion to this rise of profit. The employer of the flax dressers would, in selling his flax, require an additional five per cent upon the whole value of the materials and wages which he advanced to his workmen. The employer of the spinners would require an additional five per cent, both upon the advanced price of the flax and upon the wages of the spinners. And the employer of the weavers would require alike five per cent, both upon the advanced price of the linen yarn and upon the wages of the weavers. In raising the price of commodities, the rise of wages operates in the same manner as simple interest does in the accumulation of debt. The rise of profit operates like compound interest. Our merchants and master manufacturers complain much of the bad effects of high wages in raising the price, and thereby lessening the sale of their goods, both at home and abroad. They say nothing concerning the bad effects of high profits. They are silent with regard to the pernicious effects of their own gains. They complain only of those of other people. End of Book 1, Chapter 9、1 of Chapter 10 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part one of chapter ten of book one of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock. The whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock must, in the same neighborhood, be either perfectly equal or continually tending to equality. 
if in the same neighborhood there was any employment evidently either more or less advantageous than the rest so many people would crowd into it in the one case and so many would desert it in the other that its advantages would soon return to the level of other employments this at least would be the case in a society where things were left to follow their natural course where there was perfect liberty and where every man was perfectly free both to choose what occupation he thought proper and to change it as often as he thought proper every man's interest would prompt him to seek the advantageous and to shun the disadvantageous employment pecuniary wages and profit indeed are everywhere in europe extremely different according to the different employments of labour and stock but this difference arises partly from certain circumstances in the employments themselves which either really or at least in the imagination of men make up for a small pecuniary gain in some and counterbalance a great one in others and partly from the policy of europe which nowhere leaves things at perfect liberty the particular consideration of those circumstances and of that policy will divide this chapter into two parts part one inequalities arising from the nature of the employments themselves the five following are the principal circumstances which so far as i have been able to observe make up for a small pecuniary gain in some employments and counterbalance a great one in others first the agreeableness or disagreeableness of the employments themselves secondly the easiness and cheapness or the difficulty and expense of learning them thirdly the constancy or inconstancy of employment in them fourthly the small or great trust which must be reposed in those who exercise them, and fifthly, the probability or improbability of success in them. First, the wages of labor vary with the ease or hardship, the cleanliness or dirtiness, the honorableness or dishonorableness of the employment. Thus, in most places, take the year round, a journeyman tailor earns less than a journeyman weaver. His work is much easier. A journeyman weaver earns less than a journeyman smith. His work is not always easier, but it is much cleanlier. A journeyman blacksmith, though an artificer, seldom earns so much in twelve hours as a collier, who is only a laborer, does in eight. His work is not quite so dirty, is less dangerous, and is carried on in daylight and above ground. Honor makes a great part of the reward of all honorable professions. In point of pecuniary gain, all things considered, they are generally under-recompensed, as I shall endeavor to show by and by disgrace has the contrary effect the trade of a butcher is a brutal and an odious business but it is in most places more profitable than the greater part of common trades the most detestable of all employments that of public executioner is in proportion to the quantity of work done better paid than any common trade whatever hunting and fishing the most important employments of mankind in the rude state of society become in its advanced state their most agreeable amusements and they pursue for pleasure what they once followed from necessity in the advanced state of society therefore they are all very poor people who follow as a trade what other people pursue as a pastime fishermen have been so since the time of theocritus a poacher is everywhere a very poor man in great britain in countries where the rigor of the law suffers no poachers the licensed hunter is not in a much better condition the natural taste for those employments makes more people follow them than can live comfortably by them and the produce of their labor in proportion to its quantity comes always too cheap to market to afford anything but the most scanty subsistence to the laborers disagreeableness and disgrace affect the profits of stock in the same manner as the wages of labor the keeper of an inn or tavern who is never master of his own house and who is exposed to the brutality of every drunkard exercises neither a very agreeable nor a very creditable business but there is scarce any common trade in which a small stock yields so great a profit secondly the wages of labor vary with the easiness and cheapness or the difficulty and expense of learning the business when any expensive machine is erected the extraordinary work to be performed by it before it is worn out it must be expected will replace the capital laid out upon it with at least the ordinary profits a man educated at the expense of much labor and time to any of those employments which require extraordinary dexterity and skill may be compared to one of those expensive machines the work which he learns to perform it must be expected over and above the usual wages of common labor will replace to him the whole expense of his education with at least the ordinary profits of an equally valuable capital 
it must do this too in a reasonable time regard being had to the very uncertain duration of human life in the same manner as to the more certain duration of the machine the difference between the wages of skilled labour and those of common labour is founded upon this principle the policy of europe considers the labour of all mechanics artificers and manufacturers as skilled labour and that of all country labourers as common labour it seems to suppose that of the former to be of a more nice and delicate nature than that of the latter it is so perhaps in some cases but in the greater part it is quite otherwise as i shall endeavour to show by and by the laws and customs of europe therefore in order to qualify any person for exercising the one species of labour impose the necessity of an apprenticeship though with different degrees of rigour in different places they leave the other free and open to everybody during the continuance of the apprenticeship the whole labour of the apprentice belongs to his master in the meantime he must in many cases be maintained by his parents or relations and in almost all cases must be clothed by them some money too is commonly given to the master for teaching him his trade they who cannot give money give time or become bound for more than the usual number of years a consideration which though it is not always advantageous to the master on account of the usual idleness of apprentices is always disadvantageous to the apprentice in country labour on the contrary the labourer while he is employed about the easier learns the more difficult parts of his business and his own labour maintains him through all the different stages of his employment it is reasonable therefore that in europe the wages of mechanics artificers and manufacturers should be somewhat higher than those of common labourers they are so accordingly and their superior gains make them in most places be considered as a superior rank of people this superiority however is generally very small the daily or weekly earnings of a journeyman in the more common sorts of manufactures such as those of plain linen and woollen cloth computed at an average are in most places very little more than the day wages of common labourers their employment indeed is more steady and uniform and the superiority of their earnings taking the whole year together may be somewhat greater it seems evidently however to be no greater than what is sufficient to compensate the superior expense of their education education in the ingenious arts and in the liberal professions is still more tedious and expensive the pecuniary recompense therefore of painters and sculptors of lawyers and physicians ought to be much more liberal and it is so accordingly the profits of stock seem to be very little affected by the easiness or difficulty of learning the trade in which it is employed all the different ways in which stock is commonly employed in great towns seem in reality to be almost equally easy and equally difficult to learn one branch either of foreign or domestic trade cannot well be a much more intricate business than another thirdly the wages of labour in different occupations vary with the constancy or inconstancy of employment employment is much more constant in some trades than in others in the greater part of manufactures a journeyman may be pretty sure of employment almost every day in the year that he is able to work a mason or bricklayer on the contrary can work neither in hard frost nor in foul weather and his employment at all other times depends upon the occasional calls of his customers he is liable in consequence to be frequently without any what he earns therefore while he is employed must not only maintain him while he is idle but make him some compensation for those anxious and desponding moments which the thought of so precarious a situation must sometimes occasion where the computed earnings of the greater part of manufacturers accordingly are nearly upon a level with the day wages of common labourers those of masons and bricklayers are generally from one half more to double those wages where common labourers earn four or five shillings a week masons and bricklayers frequently earn seven and eight where the former earn six the latter often earn nine and ten and where the former earn nine and ten as in london the latter commonly earn fifteen and eighteen no species of skilled labour however seems more easy to learn than that of masons and bricklayers chairmen in london during the summer season are said sometimes to be employed as bricklayers the high wages of those workmen therefore are not so much the recompense of their skill as the compensation for the inconstancy of their employment a house carpenter seems to exercise rather a nicer and a more ingenious trade than a mason in most places however for it is not universally so his day wages are somewhat lower his employment though it depends much does not depend so entirely upon the occasional call of his customers and it is not liable to be interrupted by the weather when the trades which generally afford constant employment happen in a particular place not to do so the wages of the workmen always rise a good deal above their ordinary proportion to those of common labour 
In London, almost all journeymen artificers are liable to be called upon and dismissed by their masters from day to day, and from week to week, in the same manner as day labourers in other places. The lowest order of artificers, journeymen tailors, accordingly, earn their half a crown a day, though eighteen pence may be reckoned the wages of common labour. In small towns and country villages, the wages of journeymen tailors frequently scarce equal those of common labour, but in London they are often many weeks without employment, particularly during the summer. When the inconstancy of employment is combined with the hardship, disagreeableness, and dirtiness of the work, it sometimes raises the wages of the most common labour above those of the most skilful artificers. A collier working by the piece is supposed at Newcastle to earn commonly about double, and, in many parts of Scotland, about three times the wages of common labour. His high wages arise altogether from the hardship, disagreeableness, and dirtiness of his work. His employment may, upon most occasions, be as constant as he pleases. The coal-heavers in London exercise a trade which, in hardship, dirtiness, and disagreeableness, almost equals that of colliers, and, from the unavoidable irregularity in the arrivals of coal-ships, the employment of the greater part of them is necessarily very inconstant. If colliers, therefore, commonly earn double and triple the wages of common labour, it ought not to seem unreasonable that coal-heavers should sometimes earn four and five times those wages. In the inquiry made into their condition a few years ago, it was found that, at the rate at which they were then paid, they could earn from six to ten shillings a day. Six shillings are about four times the wages of common labour in London, and, in every particular trade, the lowest common earnings may always be considered as those of the far greater number. How extravagant, soever, those earnings may appear, if they were more than sufficient to compensate all the disagreeable circumstances of the business, there would soon be so great a number of competitors as, in a trade which has no exclusive privilege, would quickly reduce them to a lower rate. The constancy or inconstancy of employment cannot affect the ordinary profits of stock in any particular trade. Whether the stock is or is not constantly employed depends not upon the trade, but the trader. Fourthly, the wages of labor vary accordingly to the small or great trust which must be reposed in the workmen. The wages of goldsmiths and jewelers are everywhere superior to those of many other workmen, not only of equal, but of much superior ingenuity, on account of the precious materials with which they are entrusted. We trust our health to the physician, our fortune, and sometimes our life and reputation to the lawyer and attorney. Such confidence could not safely be reposed in people of a very mean or low condition. Their reward must be such, therefore, as may give them that rank in the society which so important a trust requires. The long time and the great expense which must be laid out in their education, when combined with this circumstance, necessarily enhance still further the price of their labor. When a person employs only his own stock and trade, there is no trust, and the credit which he may get from other people depends not upon the nature of the trade, but upon their opinion of his fortune, probity, and prudence. The different rates of profit, therefore, in the different branches of trade, cannot arise from the different degrees of trust reposed in the traders. Fifthly, the wages of labor in different employments vary according to the probability or improbability of success in them. The probability that any particular person shall ever be qualified for the employments to which he is educated is very different in different occupations. In the greatest part of mechanic trades, success is almost certain, but very uncertain in the liberal professions. Put your son apprentice to a shoemaker. There is little doubt of his learning to make a pair of shoes. But send him to study the law. It is at least twenty to one if he ever makes such proficiency as will enable him to live by the business. In a perfectly fair lottery, those who draw the prizes ought to gain all that is lost by those who draw the blanks. In a profession where twenty fail for one that succeeds, that one ought to gain all that should have been gained by the unsuccessful twenty. The counsellor at law, who perhaps at near forty years of age begins to make something by his profession, ought to receive the retribution, not only of his own so tedious and expensive education, but of that of more than twenty others, who are never likely to make anything by it. How extravagant soever the fees of counsellors at law may sometimes appear, their real retribution is never equal to this. Compute, in any particular place, what is likely to be annually gained, and what is likely to be annually spent, by all the different workmen in any common trade, such as that of shoemakers or weavers, and you will find that the former sum will generally exceed the latter. 
but make the same computation with regard to all the counsellors and students of law in all the different ends of court and you will find that their annual gains bear but a very small proportion to their annual expense even though you rate the former as a high and the latter as low as can well be done the lottery of the law therefore is very far from being a perfectly fair lottery and that as well as many other liberal and honourable professions is in point of pecuniary gain evidently under recompensed those professions keep their level however with other occupations and notwithstanding these discouragements all the most generous and liberal spirits are eager to crowd into them two different causes contribute to recommend them first the desire of the reputation which attends upon superior excellence in any of them and secondly the natural confidence which every man has more or less not only in his own abilities but in his own good fortune to excel in any profession in which but few arrive at mediocrity it is the most decisive mark of what is called genius or superior talents the public admiration which attends upon such distinguished abilities makes always a part of their reward a greater or smaller in proportion as it is higher or lower in degree it makes a considerable part of that reward in the profession of physic a still greater perhaps in that of law in poetry and philosophy it makes almost the whole there are some very agreeable and beautiful talents of which the possession commands a certain sort of admiration but of which the exercise for the sake of gain is considered whether from reason or prejudice as a sort of public prostitution the pecuniary recompense therefore of those who exercise them in this manner must be sufficient not only to pay for the time labour and expense of acquiring the talents but for the discredit which attends the employment of them as the means of subsistence the exorbitant rewards of players opera singers opera dancers etc are founded upon those two principles the rarity and beauty of the talents and the discredit of employing them in this manner it seems absurd at first sight that we should despise their persons and yet reward their talents with the most profuse liberality while we do the one however we must of necessity do the other should the public opinion or prejudice ever alter with regard to such occupations their pecuniary recompense would quickly diminish more people would apply to them and the competition would quickly reduce the price of their labour such talents though far from being common are by no means so rare as imagined many people possess them in great perfection who disdain to make this use of them and many more are capable of acquiring them if anything could be made honourably by them the overweening conceit which the greater part of men have of their own abilities is an ancient evil remarked by the philosophers and moralists of all ages their absurd presumption in their own good fortune has been less taken notice of it is however if possible still more universal there is no man living who when in tolerable health and spirits has not some share of it the chance of gain is by every man more or less overvalued and the chance of loss is by most men undervalued and by scarce any man who is in tolerable health and spirits valued more than it is worth that the chance of gain is naturally overvalued we may learn from the universal success of lotteries the world neither ever saw nor ever will see a perfectly fair lottery or one in which the whole gain compensated the whole loss because the undertaker could make nothing by it in the state lotteries the tickets are really not worth the price which is paid by the original subscribers and yet commonly sell in the market for twenty thirty and sometimes forty per cent advance the vain hopes of gaining some of the great prizes is the sole cause of this demand the soberest people scarce look upon it as a folly to pay a small sum for the chance of gaining ten or twenty thousand pounds though they know that even that small sum is perhaps twenty or thirty per cent more than the chance is worth in a lottery in which no prize exceeded twenty pounds though in other respects it approached much nearer to a perfectly fair one than the common state lotteries there would not be the same demand for tickets in order to have a better chance for some of the great prizes some people purchase several tickets and others small shares in a still greater number there is not however a more certain proposition in mathematics than that the more tickets you adventure upon the more likely you are to be a loser adventure upon all the tickets in the lottery and you lose for certain and the greater the number of your tickets the nearer you approach to this certainty that the chance of loss is frequently undervalued and scarce ever valued more than it is worth we may learn from the very moderate profit of insurers in order to make insurance either from fire or sea risk a trade at all the common premium must be sufficient to compensate the common losses to pay the expense of management and to afford such a profit as might have been drawn from an equal capital employed in any common trade the person who pays no more than this evidently pays no more than the real value of the risk or the lowest price at which he can reasonably expect to insure it 
but though many people have made a little money by insurance, very few have made a great fortune, and, from this consideration alone, it seems evident enough that the ordinary balance of profit and loss is not more advantageous in this than in other common trades, by which so many people make fortunes. Moderate, however, as the premium of insurance commonly is, many people despise the risk too much to care to pay it. Taking the whole kingdom at an average, nineteen houses in twenty, or rather perhaps ninety-nine in a hundred, are not insured from fire. Sea risk is more alarming to the greater part of people, and the proportion of ships insured to those not insured is much greater. Many sail, however, at all seasons, and even in time of war, without any insurance. This may sometimes, perhaps, be done without any imprudence. When a great company, or even a great merchant, has twenty or thirty ships at sea, they may, as it were, insure one another. The premium saved upon them all may more than compensate such losses as they are likely to meet within the common course of chances. The neglect of insurance upon shipping, however, in the same manner as upon houses, is, in most cases, the effect of no such nice calculation, but of mere thoughtless rashness and presumptuous contempt of the risk. The contempt of risk and the presumptuous hope of success are in no period of life more active than at the age at which young people choose their professions. How little the fear of misfortune is then capable of balancing the hope of good luck appears still more evidently in the readiness of the common people to enlist as soldiers or to go to sea than in the eagerness of those of better fashion to enter into what are called the liberal professions. What a common soldier may lose is obvious enough. Without regarding the danger, however, young volunteers never enlist so readily as at the beginning of a new war, and though they have scarce any chance of preferment, they figure to themselves in their youthful fancies a thousand occasions of acquiring honor and distinction which never occur. These romantic hopes make the whole price of their blood. Their pay is less than that of common laborers, and, in actual service, their fatigues are much greater. End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 1Part two of chapter ten of book one of the wealth of nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part two of chapter ten of book one of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock. The lottery of the sea is not altogether so disadvantageous as that of the army. The son of a creditable laborer or artificer may frequently go to sea with his father's consent. But if he enlists as a soldier, it is always without it. Other people see some chance of his making something by the one trade. Nobody but himself sees any of his making anything by the other. The great admiral is less the object of public admiration than the great general, and the highest success in the sea service promises a less brilliant fortune and reputation than equal success in the land. The same difference runs through all the inferior ranks of preferment in both. By the rules of precedency, a captain in the navy ranks with a colonel in the army, but he does not rank with him in the common estimation. As the great prizes in the lottery are less, the smaller ones must be more numerous. Common sailors, therefore, more frequently get some fortune and preferment than common soldiers, and the hope of those prizes is what principally recommends the trade. Though their skill and dexterity are much superior to that of almost any artificer, and though their whole life is one continual scene of hardship and danger, yet for all this dexterity and skill, for all those hardships and dangers, while they remain in the condition of common sailors, they receive scarce any other recompense but the pleasure of exercising the one and of surmounting the other. Their wages are not greater than those of common laborers at the port which regulates the rate of seamen's wages. As they are continually going from port to port, the monthly pay of those who sail from all the different ports of Great Britain is more nearly upon a level than that of any other workman in those different places, and the rate of the port to and from which the greatest number sail, that is, the port of London, regulates that of all the rest. At London, the wages of the greater part of the different classes of workmen are about double those of the same classes in Edinburgh. But the sailors who sail from the port of London seldom earn above three or four shillings a month more than those who sail from the port of Leith, and the difference is frequently not so great. In time of peace and in the merchant service, the London price is from a guinea to about seven and twenty shillings the calendar month. A common laborer in London, at the rate of nine or ten shillings a week, may earn in the calendar month from forty to five and forty shillings. 
The sailor, indeed, over and above his pay, is supplied with provisions. Their value, however, may not perhaps always exceed the difference between his pay and that of the common labourer, and though it sometimes should, the excess will not be clear gain to the sailor, because he cannot share it with his wife and family, whom he must maintain out of his wages at home. The dangers and hairbreadth escapes of a life of adventures, instead of disheartening young people, seem frequently to recommend a trade to them. A tender mother, among the inferior ranks of people, is often afraid to send her son to school at a seaport town, lest the sight of ships and the conversation and adventures of the sailors should entice him to go to sea. The distant prospect of hazards, from which we can hope to extricate ourselves by courage and address, is not disagreeable to us, and does not raise the wages of labor in any employment. It is otherwise with those in which courage and address can be of no avail. In trades which are known to be very unwholesome, the wages of labor are always can be of no avail. In trades which are known to be very unwholesome, the wages of labor are always remarkably high. Unwholesomeness is a species of disagreeableness, and its effects upon the wages of labor are to be ranked under that general head. In all the different employments of stock, the ordinary rate of profit varies more or less with the certainty or uncertainty of the returns. These are, in general, less uncertain in the inland than in the foreign trade, and in some branches of foreign trade than in others in the trade to North America, for example, than in that to Jamaica. The ordinary rate of profit always rises more or less with the risk. It does not, however, seem to rise in proportion to it, or so as to compensate it quickly. Bankruptcies are most frequent in the most hazardous trades. The most hazardous of all trades, that of a smuggler, though when the adventure succeeds it is likewise the most profitable, is the infallible road to bankruptcy. The presumptuous hope of success seems to act here as upon all other occasions, and to entice so many adventurers into those hazardous trades, that their competition reduces the profit below what is sufficient to compensate the risk. To compensate it completely, the common returns ought, over and above the ordinary profits of stock, not only to make up for all occasional losses, but to afford a surplus profit to the adventurers of the same nature with the profit of insurers. But if the common returns were sufficient for all this, bankruptcies would not be more frequent in these than in other trades. Of the five circumstances, therefore, which vary the wages of labor, two only affect the profits of stock, the agreeableness or disagreeableness of the business, and the risk or security with which it is attended. In point of agreeableness or disagreeableness, there is little or no difference in the far greater part of the different employments of stock, but a great deal in those of labor and in the ordinary profit of stock, though it rises with the risk, does not always seem to rise in proportion to it. It should follow from all this that, in the same society or neighborhood, the average and ordinary rates of profit in the different employments of stock should be more nearly upon a level than the pecuniary wages of the different sorts of labor. They are so accordingly. The difference between the earnings of a common laborer and those of a well-employed lawyer or physician is evidently much greater than that between the ordinary profits in any two different branches of trade. The apparent difference, besides, in the profits of different trades is generally a deception arising from our not always distinguishing what ought to be considered as wages from what ought to be considered as profit. Apothecary's profit is become a byword, denoting something uncommonly extravagant. This great apparent profit, however, is frequently no more than the reasonable wages of labor. The skill of an apothecary is a much nicer and more delicate matter than that of any artificer whatever, and the trust which is reposed in him is of much greater importance. He is the physician of the poor in all cases, and of the rich when the distress or danger is not very great. His reward, therefore, ought to be suitable to his skill and his trust, and it arises generally from the price at which he sells his drugs. But the whole drugs which the best employed apothecary in a large market town will sell in a year may not perhaps cost him above thirty or forty pounds. Though he should sell them, therefore, for three or four hundred, or at a thousand percent profit, this may frequently be no more than the reasonable wages of his labor, charged, in the only way in which he can charge them, upon the price of his drugs. The greater part of the apparent profit is real wages disguised in the garb of profit. In a small seaport town, a little grocer will make forty or fifty per cent upon a stock of a single hundred pounds, while a considerable wholesale merchant in the same place will scarce make eight or ten per cent upon a stock of ten thousand. The trade of the grocer may be necessary for the conveniency of the inhabitants, and the narrowness of the market may not admit the employment of a larger capital in the business. The man, however, must not only live by his trade, but live by it suitably to the qualifications which it requires. Besides possessing a little capital, he must be able to read, write, 
an account and must be a tolerable judge too of perhaps fifty or sixty different sorts of goods their prices qualities and the markets where they are to be had cheapest he must have all the knowledge in short that is necessary for a great merchant which nothing hinders him from becoming but the want of a sufficient capital thirty or forty pounds a year cannot be considered as too great a recompense for the labour of a person so accomplished deduct this from the seemingly great profits of his capital and little more will remain perhaps than the ordinary profits of stock the greater part of the apparent profit is in this case too real wages the difference between the apparent profit of the retail and that of the wholesale trade is much less in the capital than in small towns and country villages where ten thousand pounds can be employed in the grocery trade the wages of the grocer's labour must be a very trifling addition to the real profits of so great a stock the apparent profits of the wealthy retailer therefore are there more nearly upon a level with those of the wholesale merchant it is upon this account that goods sold by retail are generally as cheap and frequently much cheaper in the capital than in small towns and country villages grocery goods for example are generally much cheaper bread and butcher's meat frequently as cheap it costs no more to bring grocery goods to the great town than to the country village but it costs a great deal more to bring corn and cattle as the greater part of them must be brought from a much greater distance the prime cost of grocery goods therefore being the same in both places they are cheapest where the least profit is charged upon them the prime cost of bread and butcher's meat is greater in the great town than in the country village and though the profit is less therefore they are not always cheaper there but often equally cheap in such articles as bread and butcher's meat the same cause which diminishes apparent profit increases prime cost the extent of the market by giving employment to greater stocks diminishes apparent profit but by requiring supplies from a greater distance it increases prime cost this diminution of the one and increase of the other seem in most cases nearly to counterbalance one another which is probably the reason that though the prices of corn and capital are commonly very different in different parts of the kingdom those of bread and butcher's meat are generally very nearly the same through the greater part of it though the profits of stock both in the wholesale and retail trade are generally less in the capital than in small towns and country villages yet great fortunes are frequently acquired from small beginnings in the former and scarce ever in the latter in small towns and country villages on account of the narrowness of the market trade cannot always be extended as stock extends in such places therefore though the rate of a particular person's profits may be very high the sum or amount of them can never be very great nor consequently that of his annual accumulation in great towns on the contrary trade can be extended as stock increases and the credit of a frugal and thriving man increases much faster than his stock his trade is extended in proportion to the amount of both and the sum or amount of his profits is in proportion to the extent of his trade and his annual accumulation in proportion to the amount of his profits it seldom happens however that great fortunes are made even in great towns by any one regular established and well-known branch of business but in consequence of a long life of industry frugality and attention sudden fortunes indeed are sometimes made in such places by what is called the trade of speculation the speculative merchant exercises no one regular established or well-known branch of business he is a corn merchant this year and a wine merchant the next and a sugar tobacco or tea merchant the year after he enters into every trade when he foresees that it is likely to lie more than commonly profitable and he quits it when he foresees that its profits are likely to return to the level of other trades his profits and losses therefore can bear no regular proportion to those of any one established and well-known branch of business a bold adventurer may sometimes acquire a considerable fortune by two or three successful speculations but is just as likely to lose one by two or three unsuccessful ones this trade can be carried on nowhere but in great towns it is only in places of the most extensive commerce and correspondence that the intelligence requisite for it can be had the five circumstances above mentioned though they occasion considerable inequalities in the wages of labour and profits of stock occasion none in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages real or imaginary of the different employments of either the nature of those circumstances is such that they make up for a small pecuniary gain in some and counterbalance a great one in others in order however that this equality may take place in the whole of their advantages or disadvantages three things are requisite even where there is the most perfect freedom first the employments must be well known and long established in the neighborhood secondly they must be in their ordinary or what may be called their natural state and thirdly they must be the sole or principal employments of those who occupy them 
First, this equality can take place only in those employments which are well known and have been long established in the neighborhood. Where all other circumstances are equal, wages are generally higher in new than in old trades. When a projector attempts to establish a new manufacture, he must at first entice his workmen from other employments, by higher wages than they can either earn in their own trades, or than the nature of his work would otherwise require, and a considerable time must pass away before he can venture to reduce them to the common level. Manufactures for which the demand arises altogether from fashion and fancy are continually changing, and seldom last long enough to be considered as old established manufactures. Those, on the contrary, for which the demand arises chiefly from use or necessity, are less liable to change, and the same form or fabric may continue in demand for whole centuries together. The wages of labor, therefore, are likely to be higher in manufactures of the form than in those of the latter kind. Birmingham deals chiefly in manufactures of the former kind, Sheffield in those of the latter, and the wages of labor in those two different places are said to be suitable to this difference in the nature of their manufactures. The establishment of any new manufacture, of any new branch of commerce, or of any new practice in agriculture is always a speculation from which the projector promises himself extraordinary profits. These profits sometimes are very great, and sometimes more frequently, perhaps, they are quite otherwise. But, in general, they bear no regular proportion to those of other old trades in the neighborhood. If the project succeeds, they are commonly at first very high. When the trade or practice becomes thoroughly established and well known, the competition reduces them to the level of other trades. Secondly, this equality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock can take place only in the ordinary, or what may be called the natural state of those employments. The demand for almost every different species of labor is sometimes greater and sometimes less than usual. In the one case, the advantages of the employment rise above in the other they fall below the common level. The demand for country labor is greater at hay time and harvest than during the greater part of the year, and wages rise with the demand. In time of war, when forty or fifty thousand sailors are forced from the merchant service into that of the king, the demand for sailors to merchant ships necessarily rises with their scarcity and their wages, upon such occasions, commonly rise from a guinea and seven and twenty shillings to forty shillings and three pounds a month. In a decaying manufacture, on the contrary, many workmen, rather than quit their own trade, are contented with smaller wages than would otherwise be suitable to the nature of their employment. The profits of stock vary with the price of the commodities in which it is employed. As the price of any commodity rises above the ordinary or average rate, the profits of at least some part of the stock that is employed in bringing it to market rise above their proper level, and as it falls they sink below it. All commodities are more or less liable to variations of price, but some are much more so than others. In all commodities which are produced by human industry, the quantity of industry annually employed is necessarily regulated by the annual demand, in such a manner that the average annual produce may, as nearly as possible, be equal to the average annual consumption. In some employments, it has already been observed, the same quantity of industry will always produce the same or very nearly the same quantity of commodities. In the linen or woolen manufactures, for example, the same number of hands will annually work up very nearly the same quantity of linen and woolen cloth. The variations in the market price of such commodities, therefore, can arise only from some accidental variation in the demand. A public mourning raises the price of black cloth, but as the demand for most sorts of plain linen and woolen cloth is pretty uniform, so is likewise the price. But there are other employments in which the same quantity of industry will not always produce the same quantity of commodities. The same quantity of industry, for example, will, in different years, produce very different quantities of corn, wine, hops, sugar, tobacco, etc. The price of such commodities, therefore, varies not only with the variations of demand, but with the much greater and more frequent variations of quantity, and is consequently extremely fluctuating. But the profit of some of the dealers must necessarily fluctuate with the price of the commodities. The operations of the speculative merchant are principally employed about such commodities. He endeavors to buy them up when he foresees that their price is likely to rise, and to sell them when it is likely to fall. Thirdly, this equality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock can take place only in such as are the sole or principal employments of those who occupy them. When a person derives his subsistence from one employment which does not occupy the greater part of his time, in the intervals of his leisure he is often willing to work at another for less wages than would otherwise suit the nature of the employment. 
There still subsists in many parts of Scotland a set of people called cotters, or cottagers, though they were more frequent some years ago than they are now. They are a sort of out-servants of the landlords and farmers. The usual reward which they receive from their master is a house, a small garden for pot-herbs, as much grass as will feed a cow, and perhaps an acre or two of bad arable land. When their master has occasion for their labor, he gives them, besides, two pecks of oatmeal a week, worth about sixteen pence sterling. During a great part of the year he has little or no occasion for their labor, and the cultivation of their own little possession is not sufficient to occupy the time which is left at their own disposal. When such occupiers were more numerous than they are at present, they are said to have been willing to give their spare time for a very small recompense to anybody, and to have wrought for less wages than other laborers. In ancient times they seem to have been common all over Europe. In countries ill-cultivated and worse inhabited, the greater part of landlords and farmers could not otherwise provide themselves with the extraordinary number of hands which country labor requires at certain seasons. The daily or weekly recompense which such laborers occasionally received from their masters was evidently not the whole price of their labor. Their small tenement made a considerable part of it. This daily or weekly recompense, however, seems to have been considered as the whole of it by many writers who have collected the prices of labor and provisions in ancient times, and who have taken pleasure in representing both as wonderfully low. The produce of such labor comes frequently cheaper to market than would otherwise be suitable to its nature. Stockings in many parts of Scotland are knit much cheaper than they can anywhere be wrought upon the loom. They are the work of servants and laborers who derive the principal part of their subsistence from other employment. More than a thousand pair of Shetland stockings are annually imported into Leith, of which the price is from five pence to seven pence a pair. At Lerwick, the small capital of the Shetland Islands, ten pence a day, I have been assured, is a common price of common labor. In the same islands they knit worsted stockings to the value of a guinea a pair and upwards. The spinning of linen yarn is carried on in Scotland nearly in the same way as the knitting of stockings by servants who are chiefly hired for other purposes. They earn but a very scanty subsistence, who endeavor to get their livelihood by either of those trades. In most parts of Scotland she is a good spinner who can earn twenty pence a week. In opulent countries the market is generally so extensive that any one trade is sufficient to employ the whole labor and stock of those who occupy it. Instances of people living by one employment, and at the same time deriving some little advantage from another, occur chiefly in poor countries. The following instance, however, of something of the same kind is to be found in the capital of a very rich one. There is no city in Europe, I believe, in which house rent is dearer than in London, and yet I know no capital in which a furnished apartment can be hired so cheap. Lodging is not only much cheaper in London than in Paris, it is much cheaper than in Edinburgh, of the same degree of goodness, and what may seem extraordinary, the dearness of house rent is the cause of the cheapness of lodging. The dearness of house rent in London arises not only from those causes which render it dear in all great capitals, the dearness of labor, the dearness of all the materials of building, which must be generally brought from a great distance, and above all the dearness of ground rent, every landlord acting the part of a monopolist, and frequently exacting a higher rent for a single acre of bad land in a town, than can be had for a hundred of the best in the country but it arises in part from the peculiar manners and customs of the people which oblige every master of a family to hire a whole house from top to bottom a dwelling-house in england means everything that is contained under the same roof in france scotland and many other parts of europe it frequently means no more than a single story a tradesman in london is obliged to hire a whole house in that part of the town where his customers live his shop is upon the ground floor and he and his family sleep in the garret and he endeavors to pay a part of his house rent by letting the two middle stories to lodgers. He expects to maintain his family by his trade, and not by his lodgers. Whereas, at Paris and Edinburgh, people who let lodgings have commonly no other means of subsistence, and the price of the lodging must pay not only the rent of the house, but the whole expense of the family. End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 2part three of chapter ten of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith part three of chapter ten of book one of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock
Part 2. Inequalities Occasioned by the Policy of Europe such are the inequalities in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labour and stock, which the defect of any of the three requisites above mentioned must occasion, even where there is the most perfect liberty. But the policy of Europe, by not leaving things at perfect liberty, occasions other inequalities of much greater importance. It does this chiefly in the three following ways. First, by restraining the competition in some employments to a smaller number than would otherwise be disposed to enter into them, secondly, by increasing it in others beyond what it naturally would be, and thirdly, by obstructing the free circulation of labor and stock, both from employment to employment and from place to place. First, the policy of Europe occasions a very important inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock, by restraining the competition in some employments to a smaller number than might otherwise be disposed to enter into them. The exclusive privileges of corporations are the principal means it makes use of for this purpose. The exclusive privilege of an incorporated trade necessarily restrains the competition, in the town where it is established, to those who are free of the trade. To have served an apprenticeship in the town, under a master properly qualified, is commonly the necessary requisite for obtaining this freedom. The bylaws of the corporation regulate sometimes the number of apprentices which any master is allowed to have, and almost always the number of years which each apprentice is obliged to serve. The intention of both regulations is to restrain the competition to a much smaller number than might otherwise be disposed to enter into the trade. The limitation of the number of apprentices restrains it directly. A long term of apprenticeship restrains it more indirectly, but as effectually by increasing the expense of education. In Sheffield, no master cutler can have more than one apprentice at a time, by a by-law of the corporation. In Norfolk and Norwich, no master weaver can have more than two apprentices, under pain of forfeiting five pounds a month to the king. No master hatter can have more than two apprentices anywhere in England, or in the English plantations, under pain of forfeiting five pounds a month, half to the king, and half to him who shall sue in any court of record. Both these regulations, though they have been confirmed by a public law of the kingdom, are evidently dictated by the same corporation spirit which enacted the by-law of Sheffield. The silk weavers in London had scarce been incorporated a year when they enacted a by-law restraining any master from having more than two apprentices at a time. It required a particular act of Parliament to rescind this by-law. Seven years seem anciently to have been all over Europe the usual term established for the duration of apprenticeships in the greater part of incorporated trades. All such incorporations were anciently called universities, which, indeed, is the proper Latin name for any incorporation whatever. The University of Smiths, the University of Tailors, etc., are expressions which we commonly meet with in the old charters of ancient towns. When those particular incorporations, which are now peculiarly called universities, were first established, the term of years which it was necessary to study, in order to obtain the degree of Master of Arts, appears evidently to have been copied from the term of apprenticeship in common trades, of which the incorporations were much more ancient. As to have wrought seven years under a master properly qualified, was necessary in order to entitle my person to become a master, and to have himself apprentices in a common trade. So to have studied seven years under a master properly qualified was necessary to entitle him to become a master, teacher, or doctor, words anciently synonymous, in the liberal arts, and to have scholars or apprentices, words likewise originally synonymous, to study under him. By the fifth of Elizabeth, commonly called the statute of apprenticeship, it was enacted that no person should, for the future, exercise any trade, craft, or mystery at that time exercised in England, unless he had previously served to it an apprenticeship of seven years at least, and what before had been the by-law of many particular corporations, became in England the general and public law of all trades carried on in market towns. For though the words of the statute are very general, and seem plainly to include the whole kingdom, by interpretation its operation has been limited to market towns. It having been held that, in country villages, a person may exercise several different trades, though he has not served a seven years apprenticeship to each, they being necessary for the conveniency of the inhabitants, and the number of people frequently not being sufficient to supply each with a particular set of hands. By a strict interpretation of the words, too, the operation of this statute has been limited to those trades which were established in England before the fifth of Elizabeth, and has never been extended to such as have been introduced since that time. 
This limitation has given occasion to several distinctions, which, considered as rules of police, appear as foolish as can well be imagined. It has been adjudged, for example, that a coachmaker can neither himself make nor employ journeymen to make his coach wheels, but must buy them of a master wheelwright, this latter trade having been exercised in England before the fifth of Elizabeth. But a wheelwright, though he has never served an apprenticeship to a coachmaker, may either himself make or employ journeymen to make coaches, the trade of a coachmaker not being within the statute, because not exercised in England at the time when it was made. The manufacturers of Manchester, Birmingham, and Wolverhampton are many of them upon this account not within the statute, not having been exercised in England before the fifth of Elizabeth. In France, the duration of apprenticeships is different in different towns, and in different trades. In Paris, five years is the term required in a great number, but before any person can be qualified to exercise the trade as a master, he must, in many of them, serve five years more as a journeyman. During this latter term he is called the companion of his master, and the term itself is called his companionship. In Scotland there is no general law which regulates universally the duration of apprenticeships. The term is different in different corporations. Where it is long, a part of it may generally be redeemed by paying a small fine. In most towns, too, a very small fine is sufficient to purchase the freedom of any corporation. The weavers of linen and hempen cloth, the principal manufacturers of the country, as well as all other artificers subservient to them, wheel-makers, reel-makers, etc., may exercise their trades in any town corporate without paying any fine. In all towns corporate, all persons are free to sell butcher's meat upon any lawful day of the week. Three years is, in Scotland, a common term of apprenticeship, even in some very nice trades, and, in general, I know of no country in Europe in which corporation laws are so little oppressive. The property which every man has in his own labor, as it is the original foundation of all other property, so it is the most sacred and inviolable. The patrimony of a poor man lies in the strength and dexterity of his hands, and to hinder him from employing this strength and dexterity in what manner he thinks proper, without injury to his neighbor, is a plain violation of this most sacred property. It is a manifest encroachment upon the just liberty, both of the workmen and of those who might be disposed to employ him. As it hinders the one from working at what he thinks proper, so it hinders the others from employing whom they think proper. To judge whether he is fit to be employed may surely be trusted to the discretion of the employers whose interest it so much concerns. The affected anxiety of the lawgiver, lest they should employ an improper person, is evidently as impertinent as it is oppressive. The institution of long apprenticeships can give no security that insufficient workmanship shall not frequently be exposed to public sale. When this is done, it is generally the effect of fraud and not of inability, and the longest apprenticeship can give no security against fraud. Quite different regulations are necessary to prevent this abuse. The sterling mark upon plate, and the stamps upon linen and woolen cloth, give the purchaser much greater security than any statute of apprenticeship. He generally looks at these, but never thinks it worth while to inquire whether the workman had served a seven years apprenticeship. The institution of long apprenticeships has no tendency to form young people to industry. A journeyman who works by the piece is likely to be industrious because he derives a benefit from every exertion of his industry. An apprentice is likely to be idle, and almost always is so, because he has no immediate interest to be otherwise. In the inferior employments, the sweets of labor consist altogether in the recompense of labor. They who are soonest in a condition to enjoy the sweets of it are likely soonest to conceive a relish for it, and to acquire the early habit of industry. A young man naturally conceives an aversion to labor, when for a long time he receives no benefit from it. The boys who are put out apprentices from public charities are generally bound for more than the usual number of years, and they generally turn out very idle and worthless. Apprenticeships were altogether unknown to the ancients. The reciprocal duties of master and apprentice make a considerable article in every modern code. The Roman law is perfectly silent with regard to them. I know no Greek or Latin word, I might venture, I believe, to assert that there is none, which expresses the idea we now annex to the word apprentice, a servant bound to work at a particular trade for the benefit of a master during a term of years upon condition that the master shall teach him that trade. Long apprenticeships are altogether unnecessary. The arts, which are much superior to common trades, such as those of making clocks and watches, contain no such mystery as to require a long course of instruction. 
the first invention of such beautiful machines indeed and even that of some of the instruments employed in making them must no doubt have been the work of deep thought and a long time and may justly be considered as among the happiest efforts of human ingenuity but when both have been fairly invented and are well understood to explain to any young man in the completest manner how to apply the instruments and how to construct the machines cannot well require more than the lessons of a few weeks perhaps those of a few days might be sufficient in the common mechanic trades those of a few days might certainly be sufficient the dexterity of hand indeed even in common trades cannot be acquired without much practice and experience but a young man would practice with much more diligence and attention if from the beginning he wrought as a journeyman being paid in proportion to the little work which he could execute and paying in his turn for the materials which he might sometimes spoil through awkwardness and inexperience his education would generally in this way be more effectual and always less tedious and expensive the master indeed would be a loser he would lose all the wages of the apprentice which he now saves for seven years together in the end perhaps the apprentice himself would be a loser in a trade so easily learnt he would have more competitors and his wages when he came to be a complete workman would be much less than at present the same increase of competition would reduce the profits of the masters as well as the wages of workmen the trades the crafts the mysteries would all be losers but the public would be a gainer the work of all artificers coming in this way much cheaper to market it is to prevent this reduction of price and consequently of wages and profit by restraining that free competition which would most certainly occasion it that all corporations and the greater part of corporation laws have been established in order to erect a corporation no other authority in ancient times was requisite in many parts of europe but that of the town corporate in which it was established in england indeed a charter from the king was likewise necessary but this prerogative of the crown seems to have been reserved rather for extorting money from the subject than for the defence of the common liberty against such oppressive monopolies upon paying a fine to the king the charter seems generally to have been readily granted and when any particular class of artificers or traders thought proper to act as a corporation without a charter such adultering guilds as they were called were not always disfranchised upon that account but obliged to fine annually to the king for permission to exercise their usurped privileges the immediate inspection of all corporations and of the by-laws which they might think proper to enact for their own government belonged to the town corporate in which they were established and whatever discipline was exercised over them proceeded commonly not from the king but from that greater incorporation of which those subordinate ones were only parts or members the government of towns corporate was altogether in the hands of traders and artificers and it was the manifest interest of every particular class of them to prevent the market from being overstocked as they commonly express it with their own particular species of industries which is in reality to keep it always understocked each class was eager to establish regulations proper for this purpose and provided it was allowed to do so was willing to consent that every other class should do the same in consequence of such regulations indeed each class was obliged to buy the goods they had occasion for from every other within the town somewhat dearer than they otherwise might have done but in recompense they were enabled to sell their own just as much dearer so that so far it was as broad as long as they say and in the dealings of the different classes within the town with one another none of them were losers by these regulations but in their dealings with the country they were all great gainers and in these latter dealings consists the whole trade which supports and enriches every town every town draws its whole subsistence and all the materials of its industry from the country it pays for these chiefly in two ways first by sending back to the country a part of those materials wrought up and manufactured in which case their price is augmented by the wages of the workmen and the profits of their masters or immediate employers secondly by sending to it a part both of the rude and manufactured produce either of other countries or of distant parts of the same country imported into the town in which case too the original price of those goods is augmented by the wages of the carriers or sailors and by the profits of the merchants who employ them in what is gained upon the first of those branches of commerce consists the advantage which the town makes by its manufactures in what is gained upon the second the advantage of its inland and foreign trade the wages of the workmen and the profits of their different employers make up the whole of what is gained upon both whatever regulations therefore tend to increase those wages and profits beyond what they otherwise would be tend to enable the town to purchase with a smaller quantity of its labour the produce of a greater quantity of the labour of the country 
They give the traders and artificers in the town an advantage over the landlords, farmers, and laborers in the country, and break down that natural equality which would otherwise take place in the commerce which is carried on between them. The whole annual produce of the labor of the society is annually divided between those two different sets of people. By means of those regulations, a greater share of it is given to the inhabitants of the town than would otherwise fall to them, and a less to those of the country. The price which the town really pays for the provisions and materials annually imported into it is the quantity of manufactures and other goods annually exported from it. The dearer the latter are sold, the cheaper the former are bought. The industry of the town becomes more, and that of the country less, advantageous. That the industry which is carried on in towns is, everywhere in Europe, more advantageous than that which is carried on in the country, without entering into any very nice computations, we may satisfy ourselves by one very simple and obvious observation. In every country of Europe we find at least a hundred people who have acquired great fortunes from small beginnings, by trade and manufactures, the industry which properly belongs to towns, for one who has done so by that which properly belongs to the country, the raising of rude produce by the improvement and cultivation of land. Industry, therefore, must be better rewarded, the wages of labor and the profits of stock must evidently be greater, in the one situation, than in the other. But stock and labor naturally seek the most advantageous employment. They naturally, therefore, resort as much as they can to the town and desert the country. End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 3part 4 of chapter 10 of book 1 of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith part 4 of chapter 10 of book 1 of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock the inhabitants of a town being collected into one place can easily combine together. The most insignificant trades carried on in towns have, accordingly, in some place or other, been incorporated, and even where they have never been incorporated, yet the corporation spirit, the jealousy of strangers, the aversion to take apprentices, or to communicate the secret of their trade, generally prevail in them, and often teach them, by voluntary associations and agreements, to prevent that free competition which they cannot prohibit by bylaws. The trades which employ but a small number of hands run most easily into such combinations. Half a dozen wool combers, perhaps, are necessary to keep a thousand spinners and weavers at work. By combining not to take apprentices, they can not only engross the employment, but reduce the whole manufacture into a sort of slavery to themselves, and raise the price of their labor much above what is due to the nature of their work. The inhabitants of the country, dispersed in distant places, cannot easily combine together. They have not only never been incorporated, but the incorporation spirit never has prevailed among them. No apprenticeship has ever been thought necessary to qualify for husbandry, the great trade of the country. After what are called the fine arts and the liberal professions, however, there is perhaps no trade which requires so great a variety of knowledge and experience. The innumerable volumes which have been written upon it in all languages may satisfy us that among the wisest and most learned nations it has never been regarded as a matter very easily understood. And from all those volumes we shall in vain attempt to collect that knowledge of its various and complicated operations, which is commonly possessed even by the common farmer. How contemptuously soever the very contemptible authors of some of them may sometimes affect to speak of him. There is scarce any common mechanic trade, on the contrary, of which all the operations may not be as completely and distinctly explained in a pamphlet of a very few pages, as it is possible for words illustrated by figures to explain them. In the history of the arts, now publishing by the French Academy of Sciences, several of them are actually explained in this manner. The direction of operations, besides, which must be varied with every change of the weather, as well as with many other accidents, requires much more judgment and discretion than that of those which are always the same, or very nearly the same. Not only the art of the farmer, the general direction of the operations of husbandry, but many inferior branches of country labor require much more skill and experience than the greater part of mechanic trades. The man who works upon brass and iron works with instruments and upon materials of which the temper is always the same or very nearly the same. 
but the man who ploughs the ground with a team of horses or oxen works with instruments of which the health strength and temper are very different upon different occasions the condition of the materials which he works upon too is as variable as that of the instruments which he works with and both require to be managed with much judgment and discretion the common ploughman though generally regarded as the pattern of stupidity and ignorance is seldom defective in this judgment and discretion he is less accustomed indeed to social intercourse than the mechanic who lives in a town his voice and language are more uncouth and more difficult to be understood by those who are not used to them his understanding however being accustomed to consider a great variety of objects is generally much superior to that of the other whose whole attention from morning till night is commonly occupied in performing one or two very simple operations how much the lower ranks of people in the country are really superior to those of the town is well known to every man whom either business or curiosity has led to converse much with both in china and indostan accordingly both the rank and the wages of the common labourers are said to be superior to those of the greater part of artificers and manufacturers they would probably be so everywhere if corporation laws and the corporation spirit did not prevent it the superiority which the industry of the towns has everywhere in europe over that of the country is not altogether owing to corporations and corporation laws it is supported by many other regulations the high duties upon foreign manufactures and upon all goods imported by alien merchants all tend to the same purpose corporation laws enable the inhabitants of town to raise their prices without fearing to be undersold by the free competition of their own countrymen those other regulations secure them equally against that of foreigners the enhancement of price occasioned by both is everywhere finally paid by the landlords farmers and labourers of the country who have seldom opposed the establishment of such monopolies they have commonly neither inclination nor fitness to enter into combinations and the clamour and sophistry of merchants and manufacturers easily persuade them that the private interest of a part and of a subordinate part of the society is the general interest of the whole in great britain the superiority of the industry of the towns over that of the country seems to have been greater formerly than in the present times the wages of country labour approach nearer to those of manufacturing labour and the profits of stock employed in agriculture to those of trading and manufacturing stock than they are said to have none in the last century or in the beginning of the present this change may be regarded as the necessary though very late consequence of the extraordinary encouragement given to the industry of the towns the stocks accumulated in them come in time to be so great that it can no longer be employed with the ancient profit in that species of industry which is peculiar to them that industry has its limits like every other and the increase of stock by increasing the competition necessarily reduces the profit the lowering of profit in the town forces out stock to the country where by creating a new demand for country labour it necessarily raises its wages it then spreads itself if i may say so over the face of the land and by being employed in agriculture is in part restored to the country at the expense of which in a great measure it had originally been accumulated in the town that everywhere in europe the greatest improvements of the country have been owing to such overflowings of the stock originally accumulated in the towns i shall endeavour to show hereafter and at the same time to demonstrate that though some countries have by this course attained to a considerable degree of opulence it is in itself necessarily slow uncertain liable to be disturbed and interrupted by innumerable accidents and in every respect contrary to the order of nature and of reason the interest prejudices laws and customs which have given occasion to it i shall endeavour to explain as fully and distinctly as i can in the third and fourth books of this inquiry people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices it is impossible indeed to prevent such meetings by any law which either could be executed or would be consistent with liberty and justice but though the law cannot hinder people of the same trade from sometimes assembling together it ought to do nothing to facilitate such assemblies much less to render them necessary a regulation which obliges all those of the same trade in a particular town to enter their names and places of abode in a public register facilitates such assemblies it connects individuals who might never otherwise be known to one another and gives every man of the trade a direction where to find every other man of it a regulation which enables those of the same trade to tax themselves in order to provide for their poor their sick their widows and orphans by giving them a common interest to manage renders such assemblies necessary 
An incorporation not only renders them necessary, but makes the act of the majority binding upon the whole. In a free trade, an effectual combination cannot be established but by the unanimous consent of every single trader, and it cannot last longer than every single trader continues of the same mind. The majority of a corporation can enact a by-law, with proper penalties, which will limit the competition more effectually and more durably than any voluntary combination whatever. The pretense that corporations are necessary for the better government of the trade is without any foundation. The real and effectual discipline which is exercised over a workman is not that of his corporation, but that of his customers. It is the fear of losing their employment which restrains his frauds and corrects his negligence. An exclusive corporation necessarily weakens the force of this discipline. A particular set of workmen must then be employed, let them behave well or ill. It is upon this account that, in many large incorporated towns, no tolerable workmen are to be found, even in some of the most necessary trades. If you would have your work tolerably executed, it must be done in the suburbs, where the workmen, having no exclusive privilege, have nothing but their character to depend upon, and you must then smuggle it into the town as well as you can. It is in this manner that the policy of Europe, by restraining the competition in some employments to a smaller number than would otherwise be disposed to enter into them, occasions a very important inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock. Secondly, the policy of Europe, by increasing the competition in some employments beyond what it naturally would be, occasions another equality, of an opposite kind, in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock. It has been considered as of so much importance that a proper number of young people should be educated for certain professions that sometimes the public, and sometimes the piety of private founders, have established many pensions, scholarships, exhibitions, bursaries, etc., for this purpose, which draw many more people into those trades than could otherwise pretend to follow them. In all Christian countries, I believe, the education of the greater part of churchmen is paid for in this manner. Very few of them are educated altogether at their own expense. The long, tedious, and expensive education, therefore, of those who are, will not always procure them a suitable reward, the church being crowded with people who, in order to get employment, are willing to accept of a much smaller recompense than what such an education would otherwise have entitled them to, and in this manner the competition of the poor takes away the reward of the rich. It would be indecent, no doubt, to compare either a curate or a chaplain with a journeyman in any common trade. The pay of a curate or chaplain, however, may very properly be considered as of the same nature with the wages of a journeyman. They are all three paid for their work according to the contract which they may happen to make with their respective superiors. Till after the middle of the fourteenth century, five mercs, containing about as much silver as ten pounds of our present money, was in England the usual pay of a curate or a stipendary parish priest, as we find it regulated by the decrees of several different national councils. At the same period, four pence a day, containing the same quantity of silver as a shilling of our present money, was declared to be the pay of a master mason, and three pence a day, equal to nine pence of our present money, that of a journeyman mason. The wages of both these laborers, therefore, supposing them to have been constantly employed, were much superior to those of the curate. The wages of the master mason, supposing him to have been without employment one-third of the year, would have fully equaled them. By the twelfth of Queen Anne, C-12, it is declared, that whereas for want of sufficient maintenance and encouragement to curates, the cures have, in several places, been meanly supplied, the bishop is therefore empowered to appoint, by writing under his hand and seal, a sufficient certain stipend or allowance, not exceeding fifty, and not less than twenty pounds a year. Forty pounds a year is reckoned at present very good pay for a curate, and, notwithstanding this act of Parliament, there are many curacies under twenty pounds a year. There are journeymen shoemakers in London who earn forty pounds a year, and there is scarce an industrious workman of any kind in that metropolis who does not earn more than twenty. This last sum, indeed, does not exceed what is frequently earned by common laborers in many country parishes. Whenever the law has attempted to regulate the wages of workmen, it has always been rather to lower them than to raise them. But the law has, upon many occasions, attempted to raise the wages of curates, and, for the dignity of the church, to oblige the rectors of parishes to give them more than the wretched maintenance which they themselves might be willing to accept of it. 
and in both cases the law seems to have been equally ineffectual and has never either been able to raise the wages of curates or to sink those of labourers to the degree that was intended because it has never been able to hinder either the one from being willing to accept of less than the legal allowance on account of the indigence of their situation and the multitude of their competitors or the other from receiving more on account of the contrary competition of those who expected to derive either profit or pleasure from employing them the great benefices and other ecclesiastical dignities support the honour of the church notwithstanding the mean circumstances of some of its inferior members the respect paid to the profession too makes some compensation even to them for the meanness of their pecuniary recompense in england and in all roman catholic countries the lottery of the church is in reality much more advantageous than is necessary the example of the churches of scotland of geneva and of several other protestant churches may satisfy us that in so creditable a profession in which education is so easily procured the hopes of much more moderate benefices will draw a sufficient number of learned decent and respectable men into holy orders in professions in which there are no benefices such as law and physic if an equal proportion of people were educated at the public expense the competition would soon be so great as to sink very much of their pecuniary reward it might then not be worth any man's while to educate his son to either of those professions at his own expense they would be entirely abandoned to such as had been educated by those public charities whose numbers and necessities would oblige them in general to content themselves with a very miserable recompense to the entire degradation of the now respectable professions of law and physic that unprosperous race of men commonly called men of letters are pretty much in the situation which lawyers and physicians probably would be in upon the foregoing supposition in every part of europe the greater part of them have been educated for the church but have been hindered by different reasons from entering into holy orders they have generally therefore been educated at the public expense and their numbers are everywhere so great as commonly to reduce the price of their labour to a very paltry recompense before the invention of the art of printing the only employment by which a man of letters could make anything by his talents was that of a public or private teacher or by communicating to other people the curious and useful knowledge which he had acquired himself and this is still surely a more honourable a more useful and in general even a more profitable employment than that other of writing for a bookseller to which the art of printing has given occasion the time and study the genius knowledge and application requisite to qualify an eminent teacher of the sciences are at least equal to what is necessary for the greatest practitioners in law and physic but the usual reward of the eminent teacher bears no proportion to that of the lawyer or physician because the trade of the one is crowded with indigent people who have been brought up to it at the public expense whereas those of the other two are encumbered with very few who have not been educated at their own the usual recompense however of public and private teachers small as it may appear would undoubtedly be less than it is if the competition of those yet more indigent men of letters who write for bread was not taken out of the market before the invention of the art of printing a scholar and a beggar seem to have been terms very nearly synonymous the different governors of the universities before that time appear to have often granted licenses to their scholars to beg in ancient times before any charities of this kind had been established for the education of indigent people to the learned professions the rewards of eminent teachers appear to have been much more considerable Isocrates, in what is called his discourse against the sophists reproaches the teachers of his own times with inconsistency they make the most magnificent promises to their scholars says he and undertake to teach them to be wise to be happy and to be just and in return for so important a service they stipulate the paltry reward of four or five minae they who teach wisdom continues he ought certainly to be wise themselves but if any man were to sell such a bargain for such a price he would be convicted of the most evident folly he certainly does not mean here to exaggerate the reward and we may be assured that it was not less than he represents four minae were equal to thirteen pounds six shillings and eight pence five minae to sixteen pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence something not less than the largest of those two sums therefore must at that time have been usually paid to the most eminent teachers of athens Isocrates himself demanded ten minae, or thirty-three pounds, six shilling, and eight pence, from each scholar. When he taught at Athens, he is said to have had a hundred scholars. I understand this to be the number whom he taught at one time, or who attended what we would call one course of lectures, 
a number which will not appear extraordinary from so great a city to so famous a teacher, who taught, too, what was at that time the most fashionable of all sciences, rhetoric. He must have made, therefore, by each course of lectures, a thousand minae, or three thousand three hundred and thirty-five pounds, six shillings, eight pence. A thousand minae, accordingly, is said by Plutarch, in another place, to have been his didactron, or usual price of teaching. Many other eminent teachers in those times appear to have acquired great fortunes. Georgius made a present to the temple of Delphi of his own statue in solid gold. We must not, I presume, suppose it was as large as the life. His way of living, as well as that of Hippias and Protagoras, two other eminent teachers of those times, is represented by Plato as splendid, even to ostentation. Plato himself is said to have lived with a good deal of magnificence. Aristotle, after having been tutor to Alexander, and most munificently rewarded, as it is universally agreed, both by him and his father Philip, thought it worth while, notwithstanding, to return to Athens, in order to resume the teaching of his school. Teachers of the sciences were probably in those times less common than they came to be in an age or two afterwards, when the competition had probably somewhat reduced both the price of their labor and the admiration of their persons. The most eminent of them, however, appear always to have enjoyed a degree of consideration much superior to any of the like profession in the present times. The Athenians sent Carniades the academic, and Diogenes the stoic, upon a solemn embassy to Rome, and though their city had then declined from its former grandeur, it was still an independent and considerable republic. Carniades, too, was a Babylonian by birth, and as there never was a people more jealous of admitting foreigners to public offices than the Athenians, their consideration for him must have been very great. This inequality is, upon the whole, perhaps rather advantageous than hurtful to the public. It may somewhat degrade the profession of a public teacher, but the cheapness of literary education is surely an advantage which greatly overbalances this trifling inconveniency. The public, too, might derive still greater benefit from it, if the constitution of those schools and colleges in which education is carried on was more reasonable than it is at present through the greater part of Europe. End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 4part five of chapter ten of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith part five of chapter ten of book one of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock Thirdly, the policy of Europe, by obstructing the free circulation of labor and stock, both from employment to employment and from place to place, occasions in some cases a very inconvenient inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of their different employments. The statute of apprenticeship obstructs the free circulation of labor from one employment to another, even in the same place. The exclusive privileges of corporations obstruct it from one place to another, even in the same employment. It frequently happens that while high wages are given to the workmen in one manufacture, those in another are obliged to content themselves with bare subsistence. The one is in an advancing state, and has therefore a continual demand for new hands. The other is in a declining state, and the superabundance of hands is continually increasing. Those two manufacturers may sometimes be in the same town, and sometimes in the same neighborhood, without being able to lend the least assistance to one another. The statute of apprenticeship may oppose it in the one case, and both that and an exclusive corporation in the other. In many different manufactures, however, the operations are so much alike that the workmen could easily change trades with one another, if those absurd laws did not hinder them. The arts of weaving plain linen and plain silk, for example, are almost entirely the same. That of weaving plain woolen is somewhat different, but the difference is so insignificant that either a linen or a silk weaver might become a tolerable workman in a few days. If any of those three capital manufacturers, therefore, were decaying, the workman might find a resource in one of the other two which was in a more prosperous condition, and their wages would neither rise too high in the thriving, nor sink too low in the decaying manufacture. 
The linen manufacture, indeed, is in England by a particular statute open to everybody, but as it is not much cultivated through the greater part of the country, it can afford no general resource to the workmen of other decaying manufacturers, who, wherever the statute of apprenticeship takes place, have no other choice but thither to come upon the parish or to work as common labourers, for which, by their habits, they are much worse qualified than for any sort of manufacture that bears any resemblance to their own. They generally, therefore, choose to come upon the parish. Whatever obstructs the free circulation of labor from one employment to another obstructs that of stock likewise. The quantity of stock which can be employed in any branch of business depending very much upon that of the labor which can be employed in it. Corporation laws, however, give less obstruction to the free circulation of stock from one place to another than to that of labor. It is everywhere much easier for a wealthy merchant to obtain the privilege of trading in a town corporate than for a poor artificer to obtain that of working in it. The obstruction which corporation laws give to the free circulation of labor is common, I believe, to every part of Europe. That which is given to it by the poor laws is, so far as I know, peculiar to England. It consists in the difficulty which a poor man finds in obtaining a settlement, or even in being allowed to exercise his industry in any parish but that to which he belongs. It is the labor of artificers and manufacturers only of which the free circulation is obstructed by corporation laws. The difficulty of obtaining settlements obstructs even that of common labor. It may be worth while to give some account of the rise, progress, and present state of this disorder, the greatest, perhaps, of any in the police of England. When, by the destruction of monasteries, the poor had been deprived of the charity of those religious houses, after some other ineffectual attempts for their relief, it was enacted by the 43rd of Elizabeth, C. 2, that every parish should be bound to provide for its own poor, and that overseers of the poor should be annually appointed, who, with the church wardens, should raise, by a parish rate, competent sums for this purpose. By this statute, the necessity of providing for their own poor was indispensably imposed upon every parish. Who were to be considered as the poor of each parish became, therefore, a question of some importance. This question, after some variation, was at last determined by the 13th and 14th of Charles the Second, when it was enacted that forty days' undisturbed residence should gain any person a settlement in any parish, but that within that time it should be lawful for two justices of the peace, upon complaint made by the church wardens or overseers of the poor, to remove any new inhabitant to the parish where he was last legally settled, unless he either rented a tenement of ten pounds a year, or could give such security for the discharge of the parish where he was then living, as those justices should judge sufficient. Some frauds, it is said, were committed in consequence of this statute parish officers sometimes bribing their own poor to go clandestinely to another parish and by keeping themselves concealed for forty days to gain a settlement there to the discharge of that to which they properly belonged it was enacted therefore by the first of james the second that the forty days undisturbed residence of any person necessary to gain a settlement should be accounted only from the time of his delivering notice in writing of the place of his abode and the number of his family to one of the church wardens or overseers of the parish where he came to dwell but parish officers it seems were not always more honest with regard to their own than they had been with regard to other parishes and sometimes connived at such intrusions receiving the notice and taking no proper steps in consequence of it as every person in a parish therefore was supposed to have an interest to prevent as much as possible their being burdened by such intruders it was further enacted by the third of william the third that the forty days residence should be accounted only from the publication of such notice in writing on sunday in the church immediately after divine service after all says dr burn this kind of settlement, by continuing forty days after publication of notice in writing, is very seldom obtained, and the design of the acts is not so much for gaining of settlements as for the avoiding of them by persons coming into a parish clandestinely, for the giving of notice is only putting a force upon the parish to remove. But if a person's situation is such that it is doubtful whether he is actually removable or not, he shall, by giving of notice, compel the parish either to allow him a settlement uncontested by suffering him to continue forty days, or by removing him to try the right. This statute, therefore, rendered it almost impracticable for a poor man to gain a new settlement in the old way, by forty days' inhabitancy. 
but that it might not appear to preclude altogether the common people of one parish from ever establishing themselves with security in another it appointed four other ways by which a settlement might be gained without any notice delivered or published the first was by being taxed to parish rates and paying them the second by being elected into an annual parish office and serving it in a year the third by serving an apprenticeship in the parish the fourth being hired into service there for a year and continuing in the same service during the whole of it nobody can gain a settlement by either of the two first ways but by the public deed of the whole parish who are too well aware of the consequences to adopt any newcomer who has nothing but his labour to support him either by taxing him to parish rates or by electing him into a parish office no married man can well gain any settlement in either of the last two ways an apprentice is scarce ever married and is expressly enacted that no married servant shall gain any settlement by being hired for a year the principal effect of introducing settlement by service has been to put out in a great measure the old fashion of hiring for a year which before had been so customary in england that even at this day if no particular term is agreed upon the law intends that every servant is hired for a year but masters are not always willing to give their servants a settlement by hiring them in this manner and servants are not always willing to be so hired because as every last settlement discharges all the foregoing they might thereby lose their original settlement in the places of their nativity the habitation of their parents and relations no independent workman it is evident whether labourer or artificer is likely to gain any new settlement either by apprenticeship or by service when such a person therefore carried his industry to a new parish he was liable to be removed how healthy and industrious soever at the caprice of any church warden or overseer unless he either rented a tenement of ten pounds a year a thing impossible for one who has nothing but his labour to live by or could give such security for the discharge of the parish as two justices of the peace should judge sufficient what security they shall require indeed is left altogether to their discretion but they cannot well require less than thirty pounds it having been enacted that the purchase even of a freehold estate of less than thirty pounds value shall not gain any person a settlement as not being sufficient for the discharge of the parish but this is a security which scarce any man who lives by labour can give and much greater security is frequently demanded in order to restore in some measure that free circulation of labour which those different statutes had almost entirely taken away the invention of certificates was fallen upon by the eighth and ninth of william the third it was enacted that if any person should bring a certificate from the parish where he was last legally settled subscribed by the church wardens and overseers of the poor and allowed by two justices of the peace that every other parish should be obliged to receive him that he should not be removable merely upon account of his being likely to become chargeable but only upon his becoming actually chargeable and that then the parish which granted the certificate should be obliged to pay the expense both of his maintenance and of his removal and in order to give the most perfect security to the parish where such certificated man should come to reside it was further enacted by the same statute that he should gain no settlement there by any means whatever except either by renting a tenement of ten pounds a year or by serving upon his own account in an annual parish office for one whole year and consequently neither by notice nor by service nor by apprenticeship nor by paying parish rates by the twelfth of queen anne too stat one c eighteen it was further enacted that neither the servants nor apprentices of such certificated man should gain any settlement in the parish where he resided under such certificate how far this invention has restored that free circulation of labour which the preceding statutes had almost entirely taken away we may learn from the following very judicious observation of dr burn it is obvious says he that there are diverse good reasons for requiring certificates with persons coming to settle in any place namely that persons residing under them can gain no settlement neither by apprenticeship nor by service nor by giving notice nor by paying parish rates that they can settle neither apprentices nor servants that if they become chargeable it is certainly known whether to remove them and the parish shall be paid for the removal and for their maintenance in the meantime and that if they fall sick and cannot be removed the parish which gave the certificate must maintain them none of all which can be without a certificate which reasons will hold proportionably for parishes not granting certificates in ordinary cases for it is far more than an equal chance but that they will have the certificated persons again and in a worse condition 
The moral of this observation seems to be that certificates ought always to be required by the parish where any poor man comes to reside, and that they ought very seldom to be granted by that which he purposes to leave. There is somewhat of a hardship in this matter of certificates, says the same very intelligent author in his history of the poor laws, by putting it in the power of a parish officer to imprison a man as it were for life, however inconvenient it may be for him to continue at that place where he has had the misfortune to acquire what is called a settlement, or whatever advantage he may propose himself by living elsewhere. Though a certificate carries along with it no testimonial of good behavior, and certifies nothing but that the person belongs to the parish to which he really does belong, it is altogether discretionary in the parish officers either to grant or to refuse it. A mandamus was once moved for, says Dr. Byrne, to compel the church wardens and overseers to sign a certificate, but the court of King's Bench rejected the notion as a very strange attempt. The very unequal price of labor which we frequently find in England, in places at no great distance from one another, is probably owing to the obstruction which the law of settlements gives to a poor man who would carry his industry from one parish to another without a certificate. A single man, indeed, who is healthy and industrious, may sometimes reside by sufferance without one. But a man with a wife and family who should attempt to do so would, in most parishes, be sure of being removed. And, if the single man should afterwards marry, he would generally be removed likewise. The scarcity of hands in one parish, therefore, cannot always be relieved by their superabundance in another, as it is constantly in Scotland, and, I believe, in all other countries where there is no difficulty of settlement. In such countries, though wages may sometimes rise a little in the neighborhood of a great town, or wherever else there is an extraordinary demand for labor, and sink gradually as the distance from such places increases, till they fall back to the common rate of the country, yet we never meet with those sudden and unaccountable differences in the wages of neighboring places which we sometimes find in England, where it is often more difficult for a poor man to pass the artificial boundary of a parish than an arm of the sea or a ridge of high mountains, natural boundaries which sometimes separate very distinctly different rates of wages in other countries. To remove a man who has committed no misdemeanor from the parish where he chooses to reside is an evident violation of natural liberty and justice. The common people of England, however, so jealous of their liberty, but, like the common people of most other countries, never rightly understanding wherein it consists, have now, for more than a century together, suffered themselves to be exposed to this oppression without a remedy. Though men of reflection, too, have sometimes complained of the law of settlements as a public grievance, yet it has never been the object of any general popular clamor, such as that against general warrants, an abusive practice undoubtedly, but such a one as was not likely to occasion any general oppression. There is scarce a poor man in England, of forty years of age, I will venture to say, who has not, in some part of his life, felt himself most cruelly oppressed by this ill-contrived law of settlements. I shall conclude this long chapter with observing that, though anciently it was usual to rate wages, first by general laws extending over the whole kingdom, and afterwards by particular orders of the justices of peace in every particular county, both these practices have now gone entirely into disuse. By the experience of above four hundred years, says Dr. Byrne, it seems time to lay aside all endeavors to bring under strict regulations what in its own nature seems incapable of minute limitation. For if all persons in the same kind of work were to receive equal wages, there would be no emulation and no room left for industry or ingenuity. Particular acts of Parliament, however, still attempt sometimes to regulate wages in particular trades and in particular places. Thus the eighth of George the Third prohibits, under heavy penalties, all master tailors in London, and five miles round it, from giving, and their workmen from accepting, more than two shillings and sevenpence halfpenny a day, except in the case of a general mourning. Whenever the legislature attempts to regulate the differences between masters and their workmen, its counsellors are always the masters. When the regulation, therefore, is in favor of the workmen, it is always just and equitable but it is sometimes otherwise when in favor of the masters. Thus the law which obliges the masters in several different trades to pay their workmen in money and not in goods is quite just and equitable. It imposes no real hardship upon the masters. It only obliges them to pay that value in money which they pretended to pay but did not always really pay in goods. This law is in favor of the workmen, but the eighth of George the third is in favor of the masters. 
when masters combine together in order to reduce the wages of their workmen they commonly enter into a private bond or agreement not to give more than a certain wage under a certain penalty were the workmen to enter into a contrary combination of the same kind not to accept of a certain wage under a certain penalty the law would punish them very severely and if it dealt impartially it would treat the masters in the same manner but the eighth of george the third enforces by law that very regulation which masters sometimes attempt to establish by such combinations the complaint of the workmen that it puts the ablest and most industrious upon the same footing with an ordinary workman seems perfectly well founded in ancient times too it was usual to attempt to regulate the profits of merchants and other dealers by regulating the price of provisions and other goods the assize of bread is so far as i know the only remnant of this ancient usage where there is an exclusive corporation it may perhaps be proper to regulate the price of the first necessary of life but where there is none the competition will regulate it much better than any assize the method of fixing the assize of bread established by the thirty first of george the second could not be put in practice in scotland on account of a defect in the law its execution depending upon the office of clerk of the market which does not exist there this defect was not remedied till the third of george the third the want of an assize occasioned no sensible inconveniency and the establishment of one in the few places where it has yet taken place has produced no sensible advantage in the greater part of the towns in scotland however there is an incorporation of bakers who claim exclusive privileges though they are not very strictly guarded the proportion between the different rates both of wages and profit in the different employments of labour and stock seems not to be much affected as has already been observed by the riches or poverty the advancing stationary or declining state of the society such revolutions in the public welfare though they affect the general rates both of wages and profit must in the end affect them equally in all different employments the proportion between them therefore must remain the same and cannot well be altered at least for any considerable time by any such revolutions end of book one chapter ten part five Part One of Chapter Eleven of Book One of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part One of Chapter Eleven of Book One of The Rent of the Land. Rent, considered as the price paid for the use of land, is naturally the highest which the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land. In adjusting the terms of the lease, the landlord endeavors to leave him no greater share of the produce than what is sufficient to keep up the stock from which he furnishes the seed, pays the labor, and purchases and maintains the cattle and other instruments of husbandry, together with the ordinary profits of farming stock in the neighborhood this is evidently the smallest share with which the tenant can content himself without being a loser and the landlord seldom means to leave him any more whatever part of the produce or what is the same thing whatever part of its price is over and above this share he naturally endeavours to reserve to himself as the rent of his land which is evidently the highest the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land Sometimes, indeed, the liberality, more frequently the ignorance of the landlord, makes him accept of somewhat less than this portion, and sometimes, too, though more rarely, the ignorance of the tenant makes him undertake to pay somewhat more, or to content himself with somewhat less than the ordinary profits of farming stock in the neighborhood. This portion, however, may still be considered as the natural rent of the land, or the rent at which it is naturally meant that land should, for the most part, be let the rent of the land it may be thought is frequently no more than a reasonable profit or interest for the stock laid out by the landlord upon its improvement this no doubt may be partly the case upon some occasions for it can scarce ever be more than partly the case the landlord demands a rent even for unimproved land and the supposed interest or profit upon the expense of improvement is generally an addition to this original rent those improvements besides are not always made by the stock of the landlord but sometimes by that of the tenant when the lease comes to be renewed however the landlord commonly demands the same augmentation of rent as if they had been all made by his own he sometimes demands rent for what is altogether incapable of human improvements kelp is a species of seaweed which when burnt yields an alkaline salt 
useful for making glass, soap, and for several other purposes. It grows in several parts of Great Britain, particularly in Scotland, upon such rocks only as lie within the high water mark, which are twice every day covered with the sea, and of which the produce therefore was never augmented by human industry. The landlord, however, whose estate is bounded by a kelp shore of this kind, demands a rent for it as much as for his cornfields. The sea in the neighborhood of the islands of Shetland is more than commonly abundant in fish, which makes a great part of the subsistence of their inhabitants. But in order to profit by the produce of the water, they must have a habitation upon the neighboring land. The rent of the landlord is in proportion, not to what the farmer can make by the land, but to what he can make both by the land and the water. It is partly paid in sea fish, and one of the very few instances in which rent makes a part of the price of that commodity is to be found in that country. The rent of land, therefore, considered as the price paid for the use of the land, is naturally a monopoly price. It is not at all proportioned to what the landlord may have laid out upon the improvement of the land, or to what he can afford to take, but to what the farmer can afford to give. Such parts only of the produce of land can commonly be brought to market, of which the ordinary price is sufficient to replace the stock which must be employed in bringing them thither, together with its ordinary profits. If the ordinary price is more than this, the surplus part of it will naturally go to the rent of the land. If it is not more, though the commodity may be brought to market, it can afford no rent to the landlord. Whether the price is or is not more depends upon the demand. There are some parts of the produce of land for which the demand must always be such as to afford a greater price than what is sufficient to bring them to market, and there are others for which it either may or may not be such as to afford this greater price. The former must always afford a rent to the landlord. The latter sometimes may and sometimes may not, according to different circumstances. Rent, it is to be observed, therefore, enters into the composition of the price of commodities in a different way from wages and profit. High or low wages and profit are the causes of high or low price. High or low rent is the effect of it. It is because high or low wages and profits must be paid in order to bring a particular commodity to market that its price is high or low. But it is because its price is high or low a great deal more or very little more or no more than what is sufficient to pay those wages and profit that it affords a high rent or a low rent or no rent at all. The particular consideration, first, of those parts of the produce of land which always affords some rent, secondly, of those which sometimes may and sometimes may not afford rent, and thirdly, of the variations which, in the different periods of improvement, naturally take place in the relative value of those two different sorts of rude produce, when compared both with one another and with manufactured commodities, will divide this chapter into three parts. Part 1. Of the Produce of Land Which Always Affords Rent as men, like all other animals, naturally multiply in proportion to the means of their subsistence, food is always more or less in demand. It can always purchase or command a greater or smaller quantity of labor, and somebody can always be found who is willing to do something in order to obtain it. The quantity of labor, indeed, which it can purchase is not always equal to what it could maintain, if managed in the most economical manner, on account of the high wages which are sometimes given to labor but it can always purchase such a quantity of labor as it can maintain according to the rate at which that sort of labor is commonly maintained in the neighborhood but land in almost any situation produces a greater quantity of food than what is sufficient to maintain all the labor necessary for bringing it to market in the most liberal way in which that labor is ever maintained the surplus too is always more than sufficient to replace the stock which employed that labor together with its profits Something, therefore, always remains for a rent to the landlord. The most desert moors in Norway and Scotland produce some sort of pasture for cattle, of which the milk and the increase are always more than sufficient, not only to maintain all the labor necessary for tending them, and to pay the ordinary profit to the farmer or the owner of the herd or flock, but to afford some small rent to the landlord. The rent increases in proportion to the goodness of the pasture. The same extent of ground not only maintains a greater number of cattle, but as they are brought within a smaller compass, less labor becomes requisite to tend them and to collect their produce. The landlord gains both ways, by the increase of the produce and by the diminution of the labor which must be maintained out of it. The rent of land not only varies with its fertility, whatever be its produce, but with its situation, whatever be its fertility. 
land in the neighborhood of a town gives a greater rent than land equally fertile in a distant part of the country though it may cost no more labor to cultivate the one than the other it must always cost more to bring the produce of the distant land to market a greater quantity of labor therefore must be maintained out of it and the surplus from which are drawn both the profit of the farmer and the rent of the landlord must be diminished but in remote parts of the country the rate of profit as has already been shown is generally higher than in the neighborhood of a large town a smaller proportion of this diminished surplus therefore must belong to the landlord good roads canals and navigable rivers by diminishing the expense of carriage put the remote parts of the country more nearly upon a level with those in the neighborhood of the town they are upon that account the greatest of all improvements they encourage the cultivation of the remote which must always be the most extensive circle of the country they are advantageous to the town by breaking down the monopoly of the country in its neighborhood they are advantageous even to that part of the country though they introduce some rival commodities into the old market they open many new markets to its produce monopoly besides is a great enemy to good management which can never be universally established but in consequence of that free and universal competition which forces everybody to have recourse to it for the sake of self-defence it is not more than fifty years ago that some of the counties in the neighbourhood of london petitioned the parliament against the extension of the turnpike roads into the remoter counties those remoter counties they pretended from the cheapness of labour would be able to sell their grass and corn cheaper in the london market than themselves and would thereby reduce their rents and ruin their cultivation their rents however have risen and their cultivation has been improved since that time a cornfield of moderate fertility produces a much greater quantity of food for man than the best pasture of equal extent though its cultivation requires much more labor yet the surplus which remains after replacing the seed and maintaining all that labor is likewise much greater if a pound of butcher's meat therefore was never supposed to be worth more than a pound of bread this greater surplus would everywhere be of greater value and constitute a greater fund both for the profit of the farmer and the rent of the landlord it seems to have done so universally in the rude beginnings of agriculture but the relative values of those two different species of food bread and butcher's meat are very different in the different periods of agriculture in its rude beginnings the unimproved wilds which then occupy the far greater part of the country are all abandoned to cattle there is more butcher's meat than bread and bread therefore is the food for which there is the greatest competition and which consequently brings the greatest price at buenos aires we are told by ulloa four reals one and twenty pence half penny sterling was forty or fifty years ago the ordinary price of an ox chosen from a herd of two or three hundred he says nothing of the price of bread probably because he found nothing remarkable about it an ox there he says costs little more than the labor of catching him but corn can nowhere be raised without a great deal of labor and in a country which lies upon the river plate at that time the direct road from europe to the silver mines of potosi the money price of labor could be very cheap it is otherwise when cultivation is extended over the greater part of the country there is then more bread than butcher's meat the competition changes its direction and the price of butcher's meat becomes greater than the price of bread by the extension besides of cultivation the unimproved wilds become insufficient to supply the demand for butcher's meat a great part of the cultivated lands must be employed in rearing and fattening cattle of which the price therefore must be sufficient to pay not only the labor necessary for tending them but the rent which the landlord and the profit which the farmer could have drawn from such land employed in tillage the cattle bred upon the most uncultivated moors when brought to the same market are in proportion to their weight or goodness sold at the same price as those which are reared upon the most improved land the proprietors of those moors profit by it and raise the rent of their land in proportion to the price of their cattle it is not more than a century ago that in many parts of the highlands of scotland butcher's meat was as cheap or cheaper than even bread made of oatmeal the union opened the market of england to the highland cattle their ordinary price at present is about three times greater than at the beginning of the century and the rents of many highland estates have been tripled and quadrupled in the same time in almost every part of great britain a pound of the best butcher's meat is in the present times generally worth more than two pounds of the best white bread and in plentiful years it is sometimes worth three or four pounds 
It is thus that, in the progress of improvement, the rent and profit of unimproved pasture comes to be regulated in some measure by the rent and profit of what is improved, and these again by the rent and profit of corn. Corn is an annual crop, butcher's meat a crop which requires four or five years to grow. As an acre of land, therefore, will produce a much smaller quantity of the one species of food than of the other, the inferiority of the quantity must be compensated by the superiority of the price. If it was more than compensated, more corn land would be turned into pasture, and if it was not compensated, part of what was in pasture would be brought back into corn. This equality, however, between the rent and profit of grass and those of corn, of the land of which the immediate produce is food for cattle, and of that of which the immediate produce is food for men, must be understood to take place only through the greater part of the improved lands of a great country. In some particular local situations it is quite otherwise, and the rent and profit of grass are much superior to what can be made by corn. Thus, in the neighborhood of a great town, the demand for milk and for forage to horses frequently contribute, together with the high price of butcher's meat, to raise the value of grass above what may be called its natural proportion to that of corn. This local advantage, it is evident, cannot be communicated to the lands at a distance. Particular circumstances have sometimes rendered some countries so populous that the whole territory, like the lands in the neighborhood of a great town, has not been sufficient to produce both the grass and the corn necessary for the subsistence of their inhabitants. Their lands, therefore, have been principally employed in the production of grass, the more bulky commodity, and which cannot be so easily brought from a great distance, and corn, the food of the great body of the people, has been chiefly imported from foreign countries. Holland is at present in this situation, and a considerable part of ancient Italy seems to have been so during the prosperity of the Romans. To feed well, old Cato said, as we are told by Cicero, was the first and most profitable thing in the management of a private estate. To feed tolerably well, the second, and to feed ill, the third. To plough, he ranked only in the fourth place of profit and advantage. Tillage, indeed, in that part of ancient Italy which lay in the neighborhood of Rome, must have been very much discouraged by the distributions of corn which were frequently made to the people, either gratuitously or at a very low price. This corn was brought from the conquered provinces, of which several, instead of taxes, were obliged to furnish a tenth part of their produce at a stated price, about sixpence a peck to the republic. The low price at which this corn was distributed to the people must necessarily have sunk the price of what could be brought to the Roman market from Latium, or the ancient territory of Rome, and must have discouraged its cultivation in that country. In an open country, too, of which the principal produce is corn, a well-enclosed piece of grass will frequently rent higher than any cornfield in its neighborhood. It is convenient for the maintenance of the cattle employed in the cultivation of the corn, and its high rent is, in this case, not so properly paid from the value of its own produce as from that of the corn lands which are cultivated by means of it. It is likely to fall, if ever the neighboring lands are completely enclosed. The present high rent of enclosed land in Scotland seems owing to the scarcity of enclosure, and will probably last no longer than that scarcity. The advantage of enclosure is greater for pasture than for corn. It saves the labor of guarding the cattle, which feed better, too, when they are not liable to be disturbed by their keeper or his dog. But where there is no local advantage of this kind, the rent and profit of corn, or whatever else is the common vegetable food of the people, must naturally regulate upon the land which is fit for producing it, the rent and profit of pasture. The use of the artificial grasses, of turnips, carrots, cabbages, and the other expedients which have been fallen upon to make an equal quantity of land feed a greater number of cattle than when in natural grass, should somewhat reduce, it might be expected, the superiority which, in an improved country, the price of butcher's meat naturally has over that of bread. It seems accordingly to have done so, and there is some reason for believing that, at least in the London market, the price of butcher's meat, in proportion to the price of bread, is a good deal lower in the present times than it was in the beginning of the last century. In the appendix to the life of Prince Henry, Dr. Birch has given us an account of the prices of butcher's meat as commonly paid by that prince. It is there said that the four quarters of an ox, weighing six hundred pounds, usually cost him nine pounds ten shillings, or thereabouts. That is, thirty-one shillings and eight pence per hundred pounds weight. Prince Henry died on the 6th of November, 1612, in the nineteenth year of his age. In March, 1764, there was a parliamentary inquiry into the causes of the high price of provisions at that time. 
It was then, among other proof to the same purpose, given in evidence by a Virginia merchant, that in March 1763 he had victualled his ships for twenty-four or twenty-five shillings the hundred weight of beef, which he considered as the ordinary price, whereas in that dear year he had paid twenty-seven shillings for the same weight and sort. This high price in 1764 is, however, four shillings and eight pence cheaper than the ordinary price paid by Prince Henry and it is the best beef only it must be observed which is fit to be salted for those distant voyages the price paid by prince henry amounts to three pence four-fifths per pound weight of the whole carcass coarse and choice pieces taken together and at that rate the choice pieces could not have been sold by retail for less than four and a half pence or five pence the pound in the parliamentary inquiry in seventeen sixty four the witnesses stated the price of the choice pieces of the best beef to be to the consumer four pence and four and a half pence the pound and the coarse pieces in general to be from seven farthings to two and a half pence and two and three quarter pence and this they said was in general one half penny dearer than the same sort of pieces had usually been sold in the month of march but even this high price is still a good deal cheaper than what we can well suppose the ordinary retail price to have been in the time of prince henry during the first twelve years of the last century the average price of the best wheat at the windsor market was one pound eighteen shilling three and a half pence the quarter of nine winchester bushels but in the twelve years preceding seventeen sixty four including that year the average price of the same measure of the best wheat at the same market was two pound one shilling nine and a half pence in the first twelve years of the last century therefore wheat appears to have been a good deal cheaper and butcher's meat a good deal dearer than in the twelve years preceding seventeen sixty four including that year in all great countries the greater part of the cultivated lands are employed in producing either food for men or food for cattle the rent and profit of these regulate the rent and profit of all other cultivated land if any particular produce afforded less the land would soon be turned into corn or pasture and if any afforded more some part of the lands in corn or pasture would soon be turned to that produce those productions indeed which require either a greater original expense of improvement or a greater annual expense of cultivation in order to fit the land for them appear commonly to afford the one a greater rent the other a greater profit than corn or pasture this superiority however will seldom be found to amount to more than a reasonable interest or compensation for this superior expense in a hop garden a fruit garden a kitchen garden both the rent of the landlord and the profit of the farmer are generally greater than in acorn or grass field but to bring the ground into this condition requires more expense hence a greater rent becomes due to the landlord it requires too a more attentive and skilful management hence a greater profit becomes due to the farmer the crop too at least in the hop and fruit garden is more precarious its price therefore besides compensating all occasional losses must afford something like the profit of insurance the circumstances of gardeners generally mean and always moderate may satisfy us that their great ingenuity is not commonly over recompensed their delightful art is practised by so many rich people for amusement that little advantage is to be made by those who practise it for profit because the persons who should naturally be their best customers supply themselves with all their most precious productions the advantage which the landlord derives from such improvements seems at no time to have been greater than what was sufficient to compensate the original expense of making them in the ancient husbandry after the vineyard a well-watered kitchen garden seems to have been the part of the farm which was supposed to yield the most valuable produce but democritus who wrote upon husbandry about two thousand years ago and who was regarded by the ancients as one of the fathers of the art thought they did not act wisely who enclosed a kitchen garden the profit he said would not compensate the expense of a stone wall and bricks he meant i suppose bricks baked in the sun mouldered with the rain and the winter storm and required continual repairs columella who reports this judgment of democritus does not controvert it but proposes a very frugal method of enclosing with a hedge of brambles and briars which he says he had found by experience to be both a lasting and an impenetrable fence but which, it seems, was not commonly known in the time of Democritus. Palladius adopts the opinion of Columella, which had before been recommended by Vero. In the judgment of those ancient improvers, the produce of a kitchen garden had, it seems, been little more than sufficient to pay the extraordinary culture and the expense of watering, 
for in countries so near the sun it was thought proper in those times as in the present to have the command of a stream of water which could be conducted to every bed in the garden through the greater part of europe a kitchen garden is not at present supposed to deserve a better enclosure than that recommended by columella in great britain and some other northern countries the finer fruits cannot be brought to perfection but by the assistance of a wall their price therefore in such countries must be sufficient to pay the expense of building and maintaining what they cannot be had without the fruit wall frequently surrounds the kitchen garden which thus enjoys the benefit of an enclosure which its own produce could seldom pay for that the vineyard when properly planted and brought to perfection was the most valuable part of the farm seems to have been an undoubted maxim in the ancient agriculture as it is in the modern through all the wine countries but whether it was advantageous to plant a new vineyard was a matter of dispute among the ancient italian husbandmen as we learn from columella he decides like a true lover of all curious cultivation in favour of the vineyard and endeavours to show by a comparison of the profit and expense that it was a most advantageous improvement such comparisons however between the profit and expense of new projects are commonly very fallacious and in nothing more so than in agriculture had the gain actually made by such plantations been commonly as great as he imagined it might have been there could have been no dispute about it the same point is frequently at this day a matter of controversy in the wine countries their writers on agriculture indeed the lovers and promoters of high cultivation seem generally disposed to decide with columella in favour of the vineyard in france the anxiety of the proprietors of the old vineyards to prevent the planting of any new ones seems to favour their opinion and to indicate a consciousness in those who must have the experience that this species of cultivation is at present in that country more profitable than any other it seems at the same time however to indicate another opinion that this superior profit can last no longer than the laws which at present restrain the free cultivation of the vine in seventeen thirty one they obtained an order of council prohibiting both the planting of new vineyards and the renewal of these old ones of which the cultivation had been interrupted for two years without a particular permission from the king to be granted only in consequence of an information from the attendant of the province certifying that he had examined the land and that it was incapable of any other culture the pretence of this order was the scarcity of corn and pasture and the superabundance of wine but had this superabundance been real it would without any order of council have effectually prevented the plantation of new vineyards by reducing the profits of this species of cultivation below their natural proportion to those of corn and pasture with regard to the supposed scarcity of corn occasioned by the multiplication of vineyards corn is nowhere in france more carefully cultivated than in the wine provinces where the land is fit for producing it as in burgundy guienne and the upper languedoc the numerous hands employed in the one species of cultivation necessarily encourage the other by affording a ready market for its produce to diminish the number of those who are capable of paying it is surely a most unpromising expedient for encouraging the cultivation of corn it is like the policy which would promote agriculture by discouraging manufacturers the rent and profit of those productions therefore which require either a great original expense of improvement in order to fit the land for them or a greater annual expense of cultivation though often much superior to those of corn and pasture yet when they do no more than compensate such extraordinary expense are in reality regulated by the rent and profit of those common crops it sometimes happens indeed that the quantity of land which can be fitted for some particular produce is too small to supply the effectual demand the whole produce can be disposed of to those who are willing to give somewhat more than what is sufficient to pay the whole rent wages and profit necessary for raising and bringing it to market according to their natural rates or according to the rates at which they are paid in the greater part of other cultivated land the surplus part of the price which remains after defraying the whole expense of improvement and cultivation may commonly in this case and in this case only bear no regular proportion to the like surplus in corn or pasture but may exceed it in almost any degree and the greater part of this excess naturally goes to the rent of the landlord the usual and natural proportion for example between the rent and profit of wine and those of corn and pasture must be understood to take place only with regard to those vineyards which produce nothing but good common wine such as can be raised almost anywhere upon any light gravelly or sandy soil and which has nothing to recommend it but its strength and wholesomeness 
it is with such vineyards only that the common land of the country can be brought into competition for with those of a peculiar quality it is evident that it cannot the vine is more affected by the difference of soils than any other fruit tree for some it derives a flavor which no culture or management can equal it is supposed upon any other this flavor real or imaginary is sometimes peculiar to the produce of a few vineyards sometimes it extends through the greater part of a small district and sometimes through a considerable part of a large province the whole quantity of such wines that is brought to market falls short of the effectual demand or the demand of those who would be willing to pay the whole rent profit and wages necessary for preparing and bringing them thither according to the ordinary rate or according to the rate at which they are paid in common vineyards the whole quantity therefore can be disposed of to those who are willing to pay more which necessarily raises their prices above that of common wine the difference is greater or less according as the fashionableness and scarcity of the wine render the competition of the buyers more or less eager whatever it be the greater part of it goes to the rent of the landlord for though such vineyards are in general more carefully cultivated than most others the high price of the wine seems to be not so much the effect as the cause of this careful cultivation and so valuable a produce the loss occasioned by negligence is so great as to force even the most careless to attention a small part of this high price therefore is sufficient to pay the wages of the extraordinary labor bestowed upon their cultivation and the profits of the extraordinary stock which puts that labor into motion the sugar colonies possessed by the european nations in the west indies may be compared to those precious vineyards their whole produce falls short of the effectual demand of europe and can be disposed of to those who are willing to give more than what is sufficient to pay the whole rent profit and wages necessary for preparing and bringing it to market according to the rate at which they are commonly paid by any other produce in cochin china the finest white sugar generally sells for three piastres the quintal about thirteen shillings and sixpence of our money as we are told by mr poive a very careful observer of the agriculture of that country what is there called the quintal weighs from a hundred and fifty to two hundred paris pounds or a hundred and seventy five paris pounds at a medium which reduces the price of the hundred weight english to about eight shillings sterling not a fourth part of what is commonly paid for the brown or muscovada sugars imported from our colonies and not a sixth part of what is paid for the finest white sugar the greater part of the cultivated lands in cochin china are employed in producing corn and rice the food of the great body of the people the respective prices of corn rice and sugar are there probably in the natural proportion or in that which naturally takes place in the different crops of the greater part of the cultivated land and which recompenses the landlord and farmer as nearly as can be computed according to what is usually the original expense of improvement and the annual expense of cultivation but in our sugar colonies the price of sugar bears no such proportion to that of the produce of a rice or corn field either in europe or america it is commonly said that a sugar planter expects that the rum and the molasses should defray the whole expense of his cultivation and that his sugar should be all clear profit if this be true for i pretend not to affirm it it is as if a corn farmer expected to defray the expense of his cultivation with the chaff and the straw and that the grain should be all clear profit we see frequently societies of merchants in london and other trading towns purchase waste lands in our sugar colonies which they expect to improve and cultivate with profit by means of factors and agents notwithstanding the great distance and the uncertain returns from the defective administration of justice in those countries nobody will attempt to improve and cultivate in the same manner the most fertile lands of scotland ireland or the corn provinces of north america though from the more exact administration of justice in these countries more regular returns might be expected in virginia and maryland the cultivation of tobacco is preferred as most profitable to that of corn tobacco might be cultivated with advantage through the greater part of europe but in almost every part of europe it has become a principal subject of taxation and to collect a tax from every different farm in the country where this plant might happen to be cultivated would be more difficult it has been supposed than to levy one upon its importation at the custom-house the cultivation of tobacco has upon this account been most absurdly prohibited through the greater part of europe which necessarily gives a sort of monopoly to the countries where it is allowed and as virginia and maryland produce the greatest quantity of it they share largely though with some competitors in the advantage of this monopoly the cultivation of tobacco however seems not to be so advantageous as that of sugar 
I have never even heard of any tobacco plantation that was improved and cultivated by the capital of merchants who resided in Great Britain. And our tobacco colonies send us home no such wealthy planters as we see frequently arrive from our sugar islands. Though, from the preference given in those colonies to the cultivation of tobacco above that of corn, it would appear that the effectual demand of Europe for tobacco is not completely supplied, it probably is more nearly so than that for sugar, and though the present price of tobacco is probably more than sufficient to pay the whole rent, wages, and profit necessary for preparing and bringing it to market, according to the rate at which they are commonly paid in cornland, it must not be so much more as the present price of sugar. Our tobacco planters, accordingly, have shown the same fear of the superabundance of tobacco, which the proprietors of the old vineyards in France have of the superabundance of wine. By act of assembly, they have restrained its cultivation to six thousand plants, supposed to yield a thousand weight of tobacco for every negro between sixteen and sixty years of age. Such a negro, over and above this quantity of tobacco, can manage, they reckon, four acres of Indian corn. To prevent the market from being overstocked, too, they have sometimes, in plentiful years, we are told by Dr. Douglas, I suspect he has been ill-informed, burnt a certain quantity of tobacco for every negro, in the same manner as the Dutch are said to do of spices. If such violent methods are necessary to keep up the present price of tobacco, the superior advantage of its culture over that of corn, if it still has any, will not probably be of long continuance. It is in this manner that the rent of the cultivated land, of which the produce is human food, regulates the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land. No particular produce can long afford less, because the land would immediately be turned to another use, and if any particular produce commonly affords more, it is because the quantity of land which can be fitted for it is too small to supply the effectual demand. In Europe, corn is the principal produce of land, which serves immediately for human food. Except in particular situations, therefore, the rent of corn land regulates in Europe that of all other cultivated land. Britain need envy neither the vineyards of France nor the olive plantations of Italy. Except in particular situations, the value of these is regulated by that of corn, in which the fertility of Britain is not much inferior to that of either of those two countries. If, in any country, the common and favorite vegetable food of the people should be drawn from a plant of which the most common land, with the same or nearly the same culture, produced a much greater quantity than the most fertile does of corn, the rent of the landlord, or the surplus quantity of food which would remain to him, after paying the labor, and replacing the stock of the farmer, together with its ordinary profits, would necessarily be much greater. Whatever was the rate at which labor was commonly maintained in that country, this greater surplus could always maintain a greater quantity of it, and consequently enable the landlord to purchase or command a greater quantity of it. The real value of his rent, his real power and authority, his command of the necessaries and conveniencies of life with which the labor of other people could supply him, would necessarily be much greater. A rice field produces a much greater quantity of food than the most fertile corn field, Two crops in the year, from thirty to sixty bushels each, are said to be the ordinary produce of an acre. Though its cultivation, therefore, requires more labor, a much greater surplus remains after maintaining all that labor. In those countries, therefore, where rice is the common and favorite vegetable food of the people, and where the cultivators are chiefly maintained with it, a greater share of this greater surplus should belong to the landlord than in corn countries. In Carolina, where the planters, as in other British colonies, are generally both farmers and landlords, and where rent, consequently, is confounded with profit, the cultivation of rice is found to be more profitable than that of corn, though their fields produce only one crop in the year, and though, from the prevalence of the customs of Europe, rice is not there the common and favorite vegetable food of the people. A good rice field is a bog at all seasons, and at one season a bog covered with water. It is unfit either for corn, or pasture, or vineyard, or, indeed, for any other vegetable produce that is very useful to men. And the lands which are fit for those purposes are not fit for rice. Even in the rice countries, therefore, the rent of rice lands cannot regulate the rent of the other cultivated land which can never be turned to that produce. The food produced by a field of potatoes is not inferior in quantity to that produced by a field of rice, and much superior to what is produced by a field of wheat. 12,000 weight of potatoes from an acre of land is not a greater produce than 2,000 weight of wheat. The food or solid nourishment, indeed, which can be drawn from each of those two plants is not altogether in proportion to their weight, on account of the watery nature of potatoes. 
Allowing, however, half the weight of this root to go to water, a very large allowance, such an acre of potatoes will still produce 6,000 weight of solid nourishment, three times the quantity produced by the acre of wheat. An acre of potatoes is cultivated with less expense than an acre of wheat, the fallow, which generally precedes the sowing of wheat, more than compensating the hoeing and other extraordinary culture which is always given to potatoes. Should this root ever become, in any part of Europe, like rice in some rice countries, the common and favoured vegetable food of the people, so as to occupy the same proportion of the lands in tillage, which wheat and other sorts of grain for human food do at present, the same quantity of cultivated land would maintain a much greater number of people, and the labourers being generally fed with potatoes, a greater surplus would remain after replacing all the stock, and maintaining all the labour employed in cultivation. A greater share of this surplus, too, would belong to the landlord. Population would increase, and the rents would rise much beyond what they are at present. The land which is fit for potatoes is fit for almost every other useful vegetable. If they occupy the same proportion of cultivated land which corn does at present, they would regulate in the same manner the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land. In some parts of Lancashire it is pretended, I have been told, that bread of oatmeal is a heartier food for labouring people than wheaten bread, and I have frequently heard the same doctrine held in Scotland. I am, however, somewhat doubtful of the truth of it. The common people in Scotland who are fed with oatmeal are in general neither so strong nor so handsome as the same rank of people in England who are fed with wheaten bread. They neither work so well nor look so well, and as there is not the same difference between the people of fashion in the two countries, experience would seem to show that the food of the common people in Scotland is not so suitable to the human constitution as that of their neighbours of the same rank in England. But it seems to be otherwise with potatoes. The chairmen, porters, and coal-heavers in London, and those unfortunate women who live by prostitution, the strongest men and the most beautiful women perhaps in the British dominions are said to be, the greater part of them, from the lowest rank of people in Ireland, who are generally fed with this root. No food can afford a more decisive proof of its nourishing quality, or of its being peculiarly suitable to the health of the human constitution. It is difficult to preserve potatoes through the year, and impossible to store them like corn for two or three years together. The fear of not being able to sell them before they rot discourages their cultivation and is, perhaps, the chief obstacle to their ever becoming in any great country, like bread, the principal food of all the different ranks of the people. End of Book 1, Chapter 11, Part 1「Part two of Chapter Eleven of Book One of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part two of Chapter Eleven of Book One of the Rent of the Land. Part two of the Produce of Land which sometimes does and sometimes does not afford rent. Human food seems to be the only produce of land which always and necessarily affords some rent to the landlord. Other sorts of produce sometimes may and sometimes may not, according to different circumstances. After food, clothing and lodging are the two great wants of mankind. Land, in its original rude state, can afford the materials of clothing and lodging to a much greater number of people than it can feed. In its improved state, it can sometimes feed a greater number of people than it can supply with those materials, at least in the way in which they require them and are willing to pay for them. In the one state, therefore, there is always a superabundance of these materials, which are frequently, upon that account, of little or no value. In the other, there is often a scarcity, which necessarily augments their value. In the one state, a great part of them is thrown away as useless, and the price of what is used is considered as equal only to the labor and expense of fitting it for use, and can, therefore, afford no rent to the landlord. In the other, they are all made use of, and there is frequently a demand for more than can be had. Somebody is always willing to give more for every part of them than what is sufficient to pay the expense of bringing them to market. Their price, therefore, can always afford some rent to the landlord. The skins of the larger animals were the original materials of clothing. Among nations of hunters and shepherds, therefore, whose food consists chiefly in the flesh of those animals, every man, by providing himself with food, provides himself with the materials of more clothing than he can wear. 
If there was no foreign commerce, the greater part of them would be thrown away as things of no value. This was probably the case among the hunting nations of North America, before their country was discovered by the Europeans, with whom they now exchanged their surplus peltry for blankets, firearms, and brandy, which gives it some value. In the present commercial state of the known world, the most barbarous nations, I believe, among whom land property is established, have some foreign commerce of this kind, and find among their wealthier neighbors such a demand for all the materials of clothing which their land produces, and which can neither be wrought up nor consumed at home, as raises their price above what it costs to send them to those wealthier neighbors. It affords, therefore, some rent to the landlord. When the greater part of the highland cattle were consumed on their own hills, the exportation of their hides made the most considerable article of the commerce of that country, and what they were exchanged for afforded some addition to the rent of the highland estates. The wool of England, which in old times could neither be consumed nor wrought up at home, found a market in the then wealthier and more industrious country of Flanders, and its price afforded something to the rent of the land which produced it. In countries not better cultivated than England was then, or than the highlands of Scotland are now, and which had no foreign commerce, the materials of clothing would evidently be so superabundant that a great part of them would be thrown away as useless, and no part could afford any rent to the landlord. The materials of lodging cannot always be transported to so great a distance as those of clothing, and do not so readily become an object of foreign commerce. When they are superabundant in the country which produces them, it frequently happens, even in the present commercial state of the world, that they are of no value to the landlord. A good stone quarry in the neighbourhood of London would afford a considerable rent. In many parts of Scotland and Wales it affords none. Barren timber for building is of great value in a populous and well-cultivated country, and the land which produces it affords a considerable rent. But in many parts of North America, the landlord would be much obliged to anybody who would carry away the greater part of his large trees. In some parts of the highlands of Scotland, the bark is the only part of the wood which, for want of roads and water carriage, can be sent to market. The timber is left to rot upon the ground. When the materials of lodging are so superabundant, the part made use of is worth only the labor and expense of fitting it for that use. It affords no rent to the landlord, who generally grants the use of it to whoever takes the trouble of asking it. The demand of wealthier nations, however, sometimes enables him to get a rent for it. The paving of the streets of London has enabled the owners of some barren rocks on the coast of Scotland to draw a rent from what never afforded any before. The woods of Norway and of the coasts of the Baltic find a market in many parts of Great Britain, which they could not find at home, and thereby afford some rent to their proprietors. Countries are populous, not in proportion to the number of people whom their produce can clothe and lodge, but in proportion to that of those whom it can feed. When food is provided, it is easy to find the necessary clothing and lodging, but though these are at hand, it may often be difficult to find food. In some parts of the British dominions, what is called a house may be built by one day's labor of one man. The simplest species of clothing, the skins of animals, require somewhat more labor to dress and prepare them for use. They do not, however, require a great deal. Among savage or barbarous nations, a hundredth or little more than a hundredth part of the labor of the whole year will be sufficient to provide them with such clothing and lodging as satisfy the greater part of the people. All the other ninety-nine parts are frequently no more than enough to provide them with food. But when, by the improvement and cultivation of land, the labor of one family can provide food for two, the labor of half the society becomes sufficient to provide food for the whole. The other half, therefore, or at least the greater part of them, can be employed in providing other things, or in satisfying the other wants and fancies of mankind. Clothing and lodging, household furniture, and what is called equipage, are the principal objects of the greater part of those wants and fancies. The rich man consumes no more food than his poor neighbor. In quality it may be very different, and to select and prepare it may require more labor and art, but in quantity it is very nearly the same. But compare the spacious palace and great wardrobe of the one, with the hovel and the few rags of the other, and you will be sensible that the difference between their clothing, lodging, and household furniture is almost as great in quantity as it is in quality. The desire of food is limited in every man by the narrow capacity of the human stomach. But the desire of the conveniencies and ornaments of building, dress, equipage, and household furniture seems to have no limit or certain boundary. 
Those, therefore, who have the command of more food than they themselves can consume, are always willing to exchange the surplus, or, what is the same thing, the price of it, for gratifications of this other kind. What is over and above satisfying the limited desire is given for the amusement of those desires which cannot be satisfied, but seem to be altogether endless. The poor, in order to obtain food, exert themselves to gratify those fancies of the rich, and to obtain it more certainly, they vie with one another in the cheapness and perfection of their work. The number of workmen increases with the increasing quantity of food, or with the growing improvement and cultivation of the lands, and, as the nature of their business admits of the utmost subdivisions of labor, the quantity of materials which they can work up increases in a much greater proportion than their numbers. Hence arises a demand for every sort of material which human invention can employ, either usefully or ornamentally, in building, dress, equipage, or household furniture. For the fossils and minerals contained in the bowels of the earth, the precious metals, and the precious stones. Food is, in this manner, not only the original source of rent, but every other part of the produce of land which afterwards affords rent, derives that part of its value from the improvement of the powers of labor in producing food, by means of the improvement and cultivation of land. Those other parts of the produce of land, however, which afterwards afford rent, do not afford it always. Even in improved and cultivated countries, the demand for them is not always such as to afford a greater price than what is sufficient to pay the labor, and replace, together with its ordinary profits, the stock which must be employed in bringing them to market. Whether it is or is not such depends upon different circumstances. Whether a coal mine, for example, can afford any rent depends partly upon its fertility and partly upon its situation. A mine of any kind may be said to be either fertile or barren, according as the quantity of mineral which can be brought from it by a certain quantity of labor is greater or less than what can be brought by an equal quantity from the greater part of other mines of the same kind. Some coal mines, advantageously situated, cannot be wrought on account of their barrenness. The produce does not pay the expense. They can afford neither profit nor rent. There are some, of which the produce is barely sufficient to pay the labor, and replace, together with its ordinary profits, the stock employed in working them. They afford some profit to the undertaker of the work, but no rent to the landlord. They can be wrought advantageously by nobody but the landlord, who, being himself the undertaker of the work, gets the ordinary profit of the capital which he employs in it. Many coal mines in Scotland are wrought in this manner, and can be wrought in no other. The landlord will allow nobody else to work them without paying some rent, and nobody can afford to pay any. Other coal mines in the same country, sufficiently fertile, cannot be wrought on account of their situation. A quantity of mineral, sufficient to defray the expense of working, could be brought from the mine by the ordinary or even less than the ordinary quantity of labor. But in an inland country, thinly inhabited, and without either good roads or water carriage, this quantity could not be sold. Coals are a less agreeable fuel than wood. They are said, too, to be less wholesome. The expense of coals, therefore, at the place where they are consumed, must generally be somewhat less than that of wood. The price of wood, again, varies with the state of agriculture nearly in the same manner and exactly for the same reason as the price of cattle. In its rude beginnings, the greater part of every country is covered with wood, which is then a mere encumbrance of no value to the landlord, who would gladly give it to anybody for the cutting. As agriculture advances, the woods are partly cleared by the progress of tillage, and partly go to decay in consequence of the increased number of cattle. These, though they do not increase in the same proportion as corn, which is altogether the acquisition of human industry, yet multiply under the care and protection of men who store up in the season of plenty what may maintain them in that of scarcity, who, through the whole year, furnish them with a greater quantity of food than uncultivated nature provides for them and who, by destroying and extirpating their enemies, secure them in the free enjoyment of all that she provides. Numerous herds of cattle, when allowed to wander through the woods, though they do not destroy the old trees, hinder any young ones from coming up, so that, in the course of a century or two, the whole forest goes to ruin. The scarcity of wood then raises its price, it affords a good rent, and the landlord sometimes finds that he can scarce employ his best lands more advantageously than in growing barren timber, of which the greatness of the profit often compensates the lateness of the returns. This seems, in the present times, to be nearly the state of things in several parts of Great Britain, where the profit of planting is found to be equal to that of either corn or pasture. The advantage which the landlord derives from planting can nowhere exceed, at least for any considerable time, the rent which these could afford him 
and in an inland country which is highly cultivated it will frequently not fall much short of this rent upon the sea coast of a well improved country indeed if coals can conveniently be had for fuel it may sometimes be cheaper to bring barren timber for building from less cultivated foreign countries than to raise it at home in the new town of edinburgh built within these few years there is not perhaps a single stick of scotch timber whatever may be the price of wood if that of coals is such that the expense of a coal fire is nearly equal to that of a wood one we may be assured that at that place and in these circumstances the price of coals is as high as it can be it seems to be so in some of the inland parts of england particularly in oxfordshire where it is usual even in the fires of the common people to mix coals and wood together and where the difference in the expense of those two sorts of fuel cannot therefore be very great coals in the coal country are everywhere much below this highest price if they were not they could not bear the expense of a distant carriage either by land or by water a small quantity only could be sold and the coal masters and the coal proprietors find it more for their interest to sell a great quantity at a price somewhat above the lowest than a small quantity at the highest the most fertile coal mine too regulates the price of coals at all the other mines in its neighbourhood both the proprietor and the undertaker of the work find the one that he can get a greater rent the other that he can get a greater profit by somewhat underselling all their neighbours their neighbours are soon obliged to sell at the same price though they cannot so well afford it and though it always diminishes and sometimes takes away altogether both their rent and their profit some works are abandoned altogether others can afford no rent and can be wrought only by the proprietor the lowest price at which coals can be sold for any considerable time is like that of all other commodities the price which is barely sufficient to replace together with its ordinary profits the stock which must be employed in bringing them to market at a coal mine for which the landlord can get no rent but which he must either work himself or let it alone altogether the price of coals must generally be nearly about this price rent even where coals afford one has generally a smaller share in their price than in that of most other parts of the rude produce of land the rent of an estate above ground commonly amounts to what is supposed to be a third of the gross produce and it is generally a rent certain and independent of the occasional variations in the crop in coal mines a fifth of the gross produce is a very great rent a tenth the common rent and it is seldom a rent certain but depends upon the occasional variations in the produce these are so great that in a country where thirty years purchase is considered as a moderate price for the property of a landed estate ten years purchase is regarded as a good price for that of a coal mine the value of a coal mine to the proprietor frequently depends as much upon its situation as upon its fertility that of a metallic mine depends more upon its fertility and less upon its situation the coarse and still more the precious metals when separated from the ore are so valuable that they can generally bear the expense of a very long land and of the most distant sea carriage their market is not confined to the countries in the neighbourhood of the mine but extends to the whole world the copper of japan makes an article of commerce in europe the iron of spain in that of chile and peru the silver of peru finds its way not only to europe but from europe to china the price of coals in westmoreland or shropshire can have little effect on their price at newcastle and their price in the leonoy can have none at all the productions of such distant coal mines can never be brought into competition with one another but the productions of the most distant metallic mines frequently may and in fact commonly are the price therefore of the coarse and still more that of the precious metals at the most fertile mines in the world must necessarily more or less affect their price at every other in it the price of copper in japan must have some influence upon its price at the copper mines in europe the price of silver in peru or the quantity either of labour or of other goods which it will purchase there must have some influence on its price not only at the silver mines of europe but at those of china after the discovery of the mines of peru the silver mines of europe were the greater part of them abandoned the value of silver was so much reduced that their produce could no longer pay the expense of working them or replace with a profit the food clothes lodging and other necessaries which were consumed in that operation this was the case too with the mines of cuba and st domingo and even with the ancient mines of peru after the discovery of those of potosi 
the price of every metal at every mine therefore being regulated in some measure by its price at the most fertile mine in the world that is actually wrought it can at the greater part of mines do very little more than pay the expense of working and can seldom afford a very high rent to the landlord rent accordingly seems at the greater part of mines to have but a small share in the price of the coarse and a still smaller in that of the precious metals labor and profit make up the greater part of both a sixth part of the gross produce may be reckoned the average rent of the ten mines of cornwall the most fertile that are known in the world as we are told by the rev mr borlace vice-warden of the stanneries some he says afford more and some do not afford so much a sixth part of the gross produce is the rent too of several very fertile lead mines in scotland in the silver mines of peru we are told by frezier and ulloa the proprietor frequently exacts no other acknowledgment from the undertaker of the mine but that he will grind the ore at his mill paying him the ordinary mulcher or price of grinding till seventeen thirty six indeed the tax of the king of spain amounted to one-fifth of the standard silver which till then might be considered as the real rent of the greater part of the silver mines of peru the richest which have been known in the world if there had been no tax this fifth would naturally have belonged to the landlord and many mines might have been wrought which could not then be wrought because they could not afford this tax the tax of the duke of cornwall upon ten is supposed to amount to more than five per cent or one twentieth part of the value and whatever may be his proportion it would naturally too belong to the proprietor of the mine if ten was duty free but if you add one twentieth to one sixth you will find that the whole average rent of the ten mines of cornwall was to the whole average rent of the silver mines of peru as thirteen to twelve but the silver mines of peru are not now able to pay even this low rent and the tax upon silver was in seventeen thirty six reduced from one fifth to one tenth even this tax upon silver too gives more temptation to smuggling than the tax of one twentieth upon ten and the smuggling must be much easier in the precious than in the bulky commodity the tax of the king of spain accordingly is said to be very ill paid and that of the duke of cornwall very well rent therefore it is probable makes a greater part of the price of tin at the most fertile tin mines than it does of silver at the most fertile silver mines in the world after replacing the stock employed in working those different mines together with its ordinary profits the residue which remains to the proprietor is greater it seems in the coarse than in the precious metal neither are the profits of the undertakers of silver mines commonly very great in peru the same most respectable and well-informed authors acquaint us that when any person undertakes to work a new mine in peru he is universally looked upon as a man destined to bankruptcy and ruin and is upon that account shunned and avoided by everybody mining it seems is considered there in the same light as here as a lottery in which the prizes do not compensate the blanks though the greatness of some tempts many adventurers to throw away their fortunes in such unprosperous projects as the sovereign however derives a considerable part of his revenue from the produce of silver mines the law in peru gives every possible encouragement to the discovery and working of new ones whoever discovers a mine is entitled to measure off two hundred and forty six feet in length according to what he supposes to be the direction of the vein and half as much in breadth he becomes proprietor of this portion of the mine and can work it without paying any acknowledgment to the landlord the interest of the duke of cornwall has given occasion to a regulation nearly of the same kind in that ancient duchy in waste and unenclosed lands any person who discovers a tin mine may mark out its limits to a certain extent which is called bounding a mine the bounder becomes the real proprietor of the mine and may either work it himself or give it in lease to another without the consent of the owner of the land to whom however a very small acknowledgment must be paid upon working it in both regulations the sacred rights of private property are sacrificed to the supposed interest of public revenue the same encouragement is given in peru to the discovery and working of new gold mines and in gold the king's tax amounts only to a twentieth part of the standard rental it was once a fifth and afterwards a tenth as in silver but it was found that the work could not bear even the lowest of these two taxes if it is rare however say the same authors frazier and ulloa to find a person who has made his fortune by a silver it is still much rarer to find one who has done so by a gold mine this twentieth part seems to be the whole rent which is paid by the greater part of the gold mines of chile and peru gold too is much more liable to be smuggled than even silver 
not only on account of the superior value of the metal in proportion to its bulk, but on account of the peculiar way in which nature produces it. Silver is very seldom found virgin, but, like most other metals, is generally mineralized with some other body, from which it is impossible to separate it in such quantities as will pay for the expense, but by a very laborious and tedious operation, which cannot well be carried on but in workhouses erected for the purpose, and therefore exposed to the inspection of the king's officers. Gold, on the contrary, is almost always found virgin. It is sometimes found in pieces of some bulk, and even when mixed, in small and almost insensible particles with sand, earth, and other extraneous bodies, it can be separated from them by a very short and simple operation, which can be carried on in any private house by anybody who is possessed of a small quantity of mercury. If the king's tax, therefore, is but ill paid upon silver, it is likely to be much worse paid upon gold, and rent must make a much smaller part of the price of gold than that of silver. The lowest price at which the precious metals can be sold, or the smallest quantity of other goods for which they can be exchanged, during any considerable time, is regulated by the same principles which fix the lowest ordinary price of all other goods. The stock which must commonly be employed, the food, clothes, and lodging, which must commonly be consumed in bringing them from the mine to the market, determine it. It must at least be sufficient to replace that stock with the ordinary profits. Their highest price, however, seems not to be necessarily determined by anything but the actual scarcity or plenty of these metals themselves. It is not determined by that of any other commodity, in the same manner as the price of coals is by that of wood, beyond which no scarcity can ever raise it. Increase the scarcity of gold to a certain degree, and the smallest bit of it may become more precious than a diamond, in exchange for a greater quantity of other goods. The demand for those metals arises partly from their utility and partly from their beauty. If you accept iron, they are more useful than, perhaps, any other metal. As they are less liable to rust and impurity, they can more easily be kept clean, and the utensils, either of the table or the kitchen, are often, upon that account, more agreeable when made of them. A silver boiler is more cleanly than a lead, copper, or tin one, and the same quality would render a gold boiler still better than a silver one. Their principal merit, however, arises from their beauty, which renders them peculiarly fit for the ornaments of dress and furniture. No paint or dye can give so splendid a color as gilding. The merit of their beauty is greatly enhanced by their scarcity. With the greater part of rich people, the chief enjoyment of riches consists in the parade of riches, which, in their eye, is never so complete as when they appear to possess those decisive marks of opulence which nobody can possess but themselves. In their eyes, the merit of an object, which is in any degree either useful or beautiful, is greatly enhanced by its scarcity, or by the great labor which it requires to collect any considerable quantity of it, a labor which nobody can afford to pay but themselves. Such objects they are willing to purchase at a higher price than things much more beautiful and useful, but more common. These qualities of utility, beauty, and scarcity are the original foundation of the high price of those metals, or of the great quantity of other goods for which they can everywhere be exchanged. This value was antecedent to, and independent of, their being employed as coin, and was the quality which fitted them for that employment. That employment, however, by occasioning a new demand, and by diminishing the quantity which could be employed in any other way, may have afterwards contributed to keep up or increase their value. The demand for the precious stones arises altogether from their beauty. They are of no use but as ornaments, and the merit of their beauty is greatly enhanced by their scarcity, or by the difficulty and expense of getting them from the mine. Wages and profit accordingly make up, upon most occasions, almost the whole of the high price. Rent comes in, but for a very small share, frequently for no share, and the most fertile mines only afford any considerable rent. When Tavernier, a jeweller, visited the diamond mines of Golconda and Bejapur, he was informed that the sovereign of the country, for whose benefit they were wrought, had ordered all of them to be shut up except those which yielded the largest and finest stones. The other, it seems, were to the proprietor not worth the working. As the prices, both of the precious metals and of the precious stones, is regulated all over the world by their price at the most fertile mine in it, the rent which a mine of either can afford to its proprietor is in proportion not to its absolute, but to what may be called its relative fertility, or to its superiority over other mines of the same kind. 
if new mines were discovered as much superior to those of potosi as they were superior to those of europe the value of silver might be so much degraded as to render even the mines of potosi not worth the working before the discovery of the spanish west indies the most fertile mines in europe may have afforded as great a rent to their proprietors as the richest mines in peru do at present though the quantity of silver was much less it might have exchanged for an equal quantity of other goods and the proprietor's share might have enabled him to purchase or command an equal quantity either of labour or of commodities the value both of the produce and of the rent the real revenue which they afforded both to the public and to the proprietor might have been the same the most abundant mines either of the precious metals or of the precious stones could add little to the wealth of the world a produce of which the value is principally derived from its scarcity is necessarily degraded by its abundance a service of plate and the other frivolous ornaments of dress and furniture could be purchased for a smaller quantity of commodities and in this would consist the sole advantage which the world could derive from that abundance it is otherwise in estates above ground the value both of their produce and of their rent is in proportion to their absolute and not to their relative fertility the land which produces a certain quantity of food clothes and lodging can always feed clothe and lodge a certain number of people and whatever may be the proportion of the landlord it will always give him a proportionable command of the labour of those people and of the commodities with which that labour can supply him the value of the most barren land is not diminished by the neighbourhood of the most fertile on the contrary it is generally increased by it the great number of people maintained by the fertile lands afford a market to many parts of the produce of the barren which they could never have found among those whom their own produce could maintain whatever increases the fertility of land in producing food increases not only the value of the lands upon which the improvement is bestowed but contributes likewise to increase that of many other lands by creating a new demand for their produce that abundance of food of which in consequence of the improvement of land many people have the disposal beyond what they themselves can consume is the great cause of the demand both for the precious metals and the precious stones as well as for every other convenience and ornament of dress lodging household furniture and equipage food not only constitutes the principal part of the riches of the world but it is the abundance of food which gives the principal part of their value to many other sorts of riches the poor inhabitants of cuba and st domingo when they were first discovered by the spaniards used to wear little bits of gold as ornaments in their hair and other parts of their dress they seemed to value them as we would do any little pebbles of somewhat more than ordinary beauty and to consider them as just worth the picking up but not worth the refusing to anybody who asked them they gave them to their new guest at the first request without seeming to think that they had made them any very valuable present they were astonished to observe the rage of the spaniards to obtain them and had no notion that there could anywhere be a country in which many people had the disposal of so great a superfluity of food so scanty always among themselves that for a very small quantity of those glittering baubles they would willingly give as much as might maintain a whole family for many years could they have been made to understand this the passion of the spaniards would not have surprised them part three of the variations in the proportion between the respective values of that sort of produce which always affords rent and of that which sometimes does and sometimes does not afford rent the increasing abundance of food in consequence of the increasing improvement and cultivation must necessarily increase the demand for every part of the produce of land which is not food and which can be applied either to use or to ornament in the whole progress of improvement it might therefore be expected there should be only one variation in the comparative values of those two different sorts of produce the value of that sort which sometimes does and sometimes does not afford rent should constantly rise in proportion to that which always affords some rent as art and industry advance the materials of clothing and lodging the useful fossils and materials of the earth the precious metals and the precious stones should gradually come to be more and more in demand should gradually exchange for a greater and a greater quantity of food or in other words should gradually become dearer and dearer this accordingly has been the case with most of these things upon most occasions and would have been the case with all of them upon all occasions if particular accidents had not upon some occasions increased the supply of some of them in a still greater proportion than the demand 
The value of a freestone quarry, for example, will necessarily increase with the increasing improvement in population of the country round about it, especially if it should be the only one in the neighborhood. But the value of a silver mine, even though there should not be another within a thousand miles of it, will not necessarily increase with the improvement of the country in which it is situated. The market for the produce of a freestone quarry can seldom extend more than a few miles round about it, and the demand must generally be in proportion to the improvement in population of that small district. But the market for the produce of a silver mine may extend over the whole known world. Unless the world in general, therefore, be advancing in improvement and population, the demand for silver might not be at all increased by the improvement even of a large country in the neighborhood of the mine. Even though the world in general were improving, yet if, in the course of its improvements, new mines should be discovered, much more fertile than any which had been known before, though the demand for silver would necessarily increase, yet the supply might increase in so much greater proportion that the real price of that metal might gradually fall, that is, any given quantity, a pound weight of it, for example, might gradually purchase or command a smaller and a smaller quantity of labor, or exchange for a smaller and a smaller quantity of corn, the principal part of the subsistence of the laborer. The great market for silver is the commercial and civilized part of the world. If, by the general progress of improvement, the demand of this market should increase, while at the same time the supply did not increase in the same proportion, the value of silver would gradually rise in proportion to that of corn. Any given quantity of silver would exchange for a greater and a greater quantity of corn, or, in other words, the average money price of corn would gradually become cheaper and cheaper. If, on the contrary, the supply by some accident should increase for many years together in a greater proportion than the demand, that metal would gradually become cheaper and cheaper, or, in other words, the average money price of corn would, in spite of all improvements, gradually become dearer and dearer. But if, on the other hand, the supply of that metal should increase nearly in the same proportion as the demand, it would continue to purchase or exchange for nearly the same quantity of corn, and the average money price of corn would, in spite of all improvements, continue very nearly the same. These three seem to exhaust all the possible combinations of events which can happen in the progress of improvement and during the course of the four centuries preceding the present if we may judge by what has happened both in france and great britain each of those three different combinations seems to have taken place in the european market and nearly in the same order too in which i have here set them down end of book one chapter eleven part two Part 3 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 3 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Rent of Land. Digression concerning the variations in the value of silver during the course of the four last centuries. First period. In 1350, and for some time before, the average price of the quarter of wheat in England seems not to have been estimated lower than four ounces of silver, tower weight, equal to about twenty shillings of our present money. From this price it seems to have fallen gradually to two ounces of silver, equal to about ten shillings of our present money, the price at which we find it estimated in the beginning of the sixteenth century, and at which it seems to have continued to be estimated till about 1570. In 1350, being the twenty-fifth of Edward the Third, was enacted what is called the Statute of Laborers. In the preamble, it complains much of the insolence of servants who endeavored to raise their wages upon their masters. It therefore ordains that all servants and laborers should, for the future, be contented with the same wages and liveries, liveries in those times signified not only clothes, but provisions, which they had been accustomed to receive in the twentieth year of the king and the four preceding years, that, upon this account, their livery wheat should nowhere be estimated higher than ten pence a bushel, and that it should always be in the option of the master to deliver them either the wheat or the money. 
Ten pence a bushel, therefore, had, in the twenty-fifth of Edward the Third, been reckoned to a very moderate price of wheat, since it required a particular statute to oblige servants to accept of it in exchange for their usual livery of provisions. And it had been reckoned a reasonable price ten years before that, or in the sixteenth year of the king, the term to which the statute refers. But in the sixteenth year of Edward the Third, ten pence contained about half an ounce of silver, tower weight, and was nearly equal to half a crown of our present money. Four ounces of silver, tower weight, therefore, equal to six shillings and eight pence of the money of those times, and to near twenty shillings of that of the present, must have been reckoned a moderate price for the quarter of eight bushels. This statute is surely a better evidence of what was reckoned, in those times, a moderate price of grain, than the prices of some particular years, which have generally been recorded by historians and other writers, on account of their extraordinary dearness or cheapness, and from which, therefore, it is difficult to form any judgment concerning what may have been the ordinary price. There are, besides, other reasons for believing that, in the beginning of the fourteenth century, and for some time before, the common price of wheat was not less than four ounces of silver the quarter, and that of other grain in proportion. In 1309, Ralph de Born, prior of St. Augustine's Canterbury, gave a feast upon his installation day, of which William Thorne has preserved not only the bill of fare, but the prices of many particulars. In that feast were consumed, first, fifty-three quarters of wheat, which cost nineteen pounds, or seven shillings and two pence a quarter, equal to about one and twenty shillings and sixpence of our present money. Secondly, fifty-eight quarters of malt, which cost seventeen pounds ten shillings, or six shillings a quarter, equal to about eighteen shillings of our present money. Thirdly, twenty quarters of oats, which cost four pounds, or four shillings a quarter, equal to about twelve shillings of our present money. The prices of malt and oats seem here to lie higher than their ordinary proportion to the price of wheat. These prices are not recorded on account of their extraordinary dearness or cheapness, but are mentioned accidentally, as the prices actually paid for large quantities of grain consumed at a feast, which was famous for its magnificence. In 1262, being the 51st of Henry the Third, was revived an ancient statute, called the Assize of Bread and Ale, which, the king says in the preamble, had been made in the times of his progenitors, sometime kings of England. It is probably, therefore, as old at least as the time of his grandfather, Henry the Second, and may have been as old as the conquest. It regulates the price of bread according as the prices of wheat may happen to be, from one shilling to twenty shillings the quarter of the money of those times. But statutes of this kind are generally presumed to provide with equal care for all deviations from the middle price for those below it as well as for those above it. Ten shillings, therefore, containing six ounces of silver, tower weight, and equal to about thirty shillings of our present money, must, upon this supposition, have been reckoned the middle price of the quarter of wheat when this statute was first enacted, and must have continued to be so in the fifty-first of Henry the Third. We cannot, therefore, be very wrong in supposing that the middle price was not less than one-third of the highest price at which this statute regulates the price of bread, or than six shillings and eightpence of the money of those times, containing four ounces of silver, tower weight. From these different facts, therefore, we seem to have some reason to conclude that about the middle of the fourteenth century, and for a considerable time before, the average or ordinary price of the quarter of wheat was not supposed to be less than four ounces of silver, tower weight. From about the middle of the fourteenth to the beginning of the sixteenth century, what was reckoned the reasonable and moderate, that is, the ordinary or average price of wheat, seems to have sunk gradually to about one half of this price, so as at last to have fallen to about two ounces of silver, tower weight, equal to about ten shillings of our present money. It continued to be estimated at this price till about 1570. In the household book of Henry, the fifth earl of Northumberland, drawn up in 1512, there are two different estimations of wheat. In one of them it is computed at six shilling and eight pence the quarter, in the other at five shillings and eight pence only. In 1512, six shillings and eight pence contained only two ounces of silver, tower weight, and were equal to about ten shillings of our present money. From the 25th of Edward the Third to the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth, during the space of more than two hundred years, six shillings and eight pence, it appears from several different statutes, had continued to be considered as what is called the moderate and reasonable, that is, the ordinary or average price of wheat. 
the quantity of silver however contained in that nominal sum was during the course of this period continually diminishing in consequence of some alterations which were made in the coin but the increase of the value of silver had it seems so far compensated the diminution of the quantity of it contained in the same nominal sum that the legislature did not think it worth while to attend to this circumstance thus in fourteen thirty six it was enacted that wheat might be exported without a license when the price was so low as six shillings and eightpence and in fourteen sixty three it was enacted that no wheat should be imported if the price was not above six shillings and eightpence the quarter the legislature had imagined that when the price was so low there could be no inconveniency in exportation but that when it rose higher it became prudent to allow of importation six shillings and eightpence therefore containing about the same quantity of silver as thirteen shillings and fourpence of our present money one third part less than the same nominal sum contained in the time of edward the third had in those times been considered as what is called the moderate and reasonable price of wheat in fifteen fifty four by the first and second of philip and mary and in fifteen fifty eight by the first of elizabeth the exportation of wheat was in the same manner prohibited whenever the price of the quarter should exceed six shillings and eightpence which did not then contain two penny worth more silver than the same nominal sum does at present but it had soon been found that to restrain the exportation of wheat till the price was so very low was in reality to prohibit it altogether in fifteen sixty two therefore by the fifth of elizabeth the exportation of wheat was allowed from certain ports whenever the price of the quarter should not exceed ten shillings containing nearly the same quantity of silver as the like nominal sum does at present this price had at this time therefore been considered as what is called the moderate and reasonable price of wheat it agrees nearly with the estimation of the northumberland book in fifteen twelve that in france the average price of grain was in the same manner much lower in the end of the fifteenth and beginning of the sixteenth century than in the two centuries preceding has been observed both by mr dupre de saint mar and by the elegant author of the essay on the policy of grain its price during the same period had probably sunk in the same manner through the greater part of europe this rise in the value of silver in proportion to that of corn may either have been owing altogether to the increase of the demand for that metal in consequence of increasing improvement and cultivation the supply in the meantime continuing the same as before or the demand continuing the same as before it may have been owing altogether to the gradual diminution of the supply the greater part of the mines which were then known in the world being much exhausted and consequently the expense of working them much increased or it may have been owing partly to the one and partly to the other of those two circumstances in the end of the fifteenth and beginning of the sixteenth centuries the greater part of europe was approaching towards a more settled form of government than it had enjoyed for several ages before the increase of security would naturally increase industry and improvement and the demand for the precious metals as well as for every other luxury and ornament would naturally increase with the increase of riches a greater annual produce would require a greater quantity of coin to circulate it and a greater number of rich people would require a greater quantity of plate and other ornaments of silver it is natural to suppose too that the greater part of the mines which then supplied the european market with silver might be a good deal exhausted and have become more expensive in the working they had been wrought many of them from the time of the romans it has been the opinion however of the greater part of those who have written upon the prices of commodities in ancient times that from the conquest perhaps from the invasion of julius caesar till the discovery of the mines of america the value of silver was continually diminishing this opinion they seem to have been led into partly by the observations which they had occasion to make upon the prices both of corn and of some other parts of the rude produce of land and partly by the popular notion that as the quantity of silver naturally increases in every country with the increase of wealth so its value diminishes as its quantity increases in their observations upon the prices of corn three different circumstances seem frequently to have misled them first in ancient times almost all rents were paid in kind in a certain quantity of corn cattle poultry etc it sometimes happened however that the landlord would stipulate that he should be at liberty to demand of the tenant either the annual payment in kind or a certain sum of money instead of it the price at which the payment in kind was in this manner exchanged for a certain sum of money is in scotland called the conversion price 
As the option is always in the landlord to take either the substance or the price, it is necessary, for the safety of the tenant, that the conversion price should rather be below than above the average market price. In many places, accordingly, it is not much above one-half of this price. Through the greater part of Scotland, this custom still continues with regard to poultry, and in some places with regard to cattle. It might probably have continued to take place, too, with regard to corn, had not the institution of public fires put an end to it. These are annual valuations, according to the judgment of an assize, of the average price of all the different sorts of grain, and of all the different qualities of each, according to the actual market price in every different county. This institution rendered it sufficiently safe for the tenant, and much more convenient for the landlord, to convert, as they call it, the corn rent, rather at what should happen to be the price of the fires of each year, than at any certain fixed price. But the writers who have collected the prices of corn in ancient times seem frequently to have mistaken what is called in Scotland the conversion price for the actual market price. Fleetwood acknowledges, upon one occasion, that he had made this mistake. As he wrote his book, however, for a particular purpose, he does not think proper to make this acknowledgment till after transcribing this conversion price fifteen times. The price is eight shillings the quarter of wheat. This sum, in 1423, the year at which he begins with it, contained the same quantity of silver as sixteen shillings of our present money. But in 1562, the year at which he ends with it, it contained no more than the same nominal sum does at present. Secondly, they have been misled by the slovenly manner in which some ancient statutes of a size had been sometimes transcribed by lazy copiers, and sometimes, perhaps, actually composed by the legislature. The ancient statutes of assize seem to have begun always with determining what ought to be the price of bread and ale when the price of wheat and barley were at the lowest, and to have proceeded gradually to determine what it ought to be, according as the prices of those two sorts of grain should gradually rise above this lowest price. But the transcribers of those statutes seem frequently to have thought it sufficient to copy the regulation as far as the three or four first and lowest prices, saving in this manner their own labour and judging i suppose that this was enough to show what proportion ought to be observed in all higher places thus in the assize of bread and ale of the fifty-first of henry the third the price of bread was regulated according to the different prices of wheat from one shilling to twenty shillings the quarter of the money of those times but in the manuscripts from which all the different editions of the statutes, preceding that of Mr. Ruffhead, were printed, the copiers had never transcribed this regulation beyond the price of twelve shillings. Several writers, therefore, being misled by this faulty transcription, very naturally conclude that the middle price, or six shillings the quarter, equal to about eighteen shillings of our present money, was the ordinary or average price of wheat at that time. In the statute of Tumbrel and Pillory, enacted nearly about the same time, the price of ale is regulated according to every sixpence rise in the price of barley, from two shillings to four shillings the quarter. That four shillings, however, was not considered as the highest price to which barley might frequently rise in those times, and that these prices were only given as an example of the proportion which ought to be observed in all other prices, whether higher or lower, we may infer from the last words of the statute, et sic dein hips crescitur vel diminutur per sex denarios. The expression is very slovenly, but the meaning is plain enough, that the price of ale is in this manner to be increased or diminished according to every sixpence rise or fall in the price of barley. In the composition of this statute, the legislature itself seems to have been as negligent as the copiers were in the transcription of the other. In an ancient manuscript of the Regium Majestatum, an old Scotch law book, there is a statute of a size in which the price of bread is regulated according to all the different prices of wheat, from ten pence to three shillings the Scotch bowl, equal to about half an English quarter. Three shillings Scotch, at the time when this a size is supposed to have been enacted, were equal to about nine shillings sterling of our present money. Mr. Rudiman seems to conclude from this that three shillings was the highest price to which wheat ever rose in those times, and that ten pence, a shilling, or at most two shillings, were the ordinary prices. Upon consulting the manuscript, however, it appears evidently that all these prices are only set down as examples of the proportion which ought to be observed between the respective prices of wheat and bread. The last words of the statute are, you shall judge of the remaining cases according to what is above written, having respect to the price of corn. 
Thirdly, they seem to have been misled, too, by the very low price at which wheat was sometimes sold in very ancient times, and to have imagined that as its lowest price was then much lower than in later times, its ordinary price must likewise have been much lower. They might have found, however, that in those ancient times its highest price was fully as much above as its lowest price was below anything that had ever been known in later times. Thus, in 1270, Fleetwood gives us two prices of the quarter of wheat, 